Hello everyone, welcome back to day number three of the Kakuna Ocala. Just a few announcements. Number one, again, if you parked and you want it validated, please give your ticket to one of the servers and they will validate it. Uh, we'd like to thank the Aulani for actually um, validating that for us, which is really nice of them to do. Remember that the vendors are in the exhibit room, the vendor supporter room right behind here for the break, if we can go and uh, support them for, and thank them for supporting us. Remember that before you leave the conference, you need to turn in your clicker, otherwise we'd have to charge you $35, which we don't want to have to do. We really appreciate the evaluations, what you liked, what you didn't like, okay. speakers you'd like to hear, topics you would like to hear. Um, don't forget to turn in your SAM sheet that we would use as a backup, just in case your clicker didn't record one of your answers. Please remember to turn off your phones to silent or turn them off. And then don't forget when you leave that you need to get your CME certificate from Valerie. She'll have the certificate, it's a duplicate. You put the number of you know, CME hours that you attended and then you tear it in half. We keep the white sheet and you take the yellow sheet home for documentation. And then if you don't know Valerie, I'll have her raise her hand again. She's in this left side on my side and she's waving her hand right now. So she helped check everyone in, but please get your CME Ticket from Valerie. Okay, and with that, uh, we'll start. You like that? I demand tech support. That was good. Okay, are we good? Good morning, everybody. Well, I guess I shouldn't say everybody. <laughs> Clearly not everybody made it yet. Um, but uh, for those of you who decided to wake up and get here, we're gonna talk about cardiac toxicity. Um, and uh, I promise I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give us a nice overview of things. And I'll start with the conclusion, which is that we still have a lot to learn. Um, and uh, you'll have to pardon me if I'm a little slow today. With all the evidence I'm gonna show you, I'm. I've yet to discover any evidence on how to handle a overtired, grumpy six-year-old when you get back from an event. 
Um, so, uh, all right. So let's start right off with the first thing that might be a question. Let's just start out with the first slide. Um, cardiac toxicity from radiation oncology, from radiation therapy is unambiguous. It does exist. Um, and uh, we're going to go through some studies that might argue whether uh, the, the severity of which it exists or, or to what degree it exists, but it does exist. Um, and so if you look at the different things that radiation can cause as a late adverse event following treatment, it can affect the, uh, the vasculature, so you can get vasculopathies, pericardial disease, conduction system disease, myocardial disease, valvular disease, in general, in general things like valvular thickening, Coronary artery disease is an, is an established um, uh, late adverse event of radiotherapy. If I was to ask about established late adverse events of radiotherapy, coronary artery disease is one. Interestingly, when you affect the conduction system, um, there have been descriptions of inappropriate sinus tachycardia, high degree AV block. Um, Atrial fibrillation is actually not something which has been well described, and in fact, there's actually a large study that looks specifically at the, the impact of radiotherapy to the heart and the incidence of atrial fibrillation, which is an extremely common thing that we see in patients, particularly as we get older, and it, uh, there is not a clear association. But I think that the, the scope here, and there's a very nice paper by Desai et al. In the, in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, which I know we're all subscribers to. <laughs> um, uh, but it's a very nice review article that kind of goes over these. So um, I, I just want to open with the fact that it's unambiguous, and we'll back into some of the evidence here. So what are some of those risk factors? Um, it's the same risk factors that we worry about for cardiotoxicity in general. So patients, hypertension, diabetes, again, use of tobacco, continuing theme here, not just lung disease, but cardiac disease as well, <coughs> management of hyperlipidemia and coronary artery disease. There are a number of competing risk factors on the non-radiation therapy side, on the systemic therapy side, such as anthracyclines and Herceptin, and of course on the radiation therapy side, and we'll expound upon this throughout the remainder of the talk, the dose of radiation, the fraction size, and the different volume of, uh, of the heart exposed to radiation. So again, as we, as we kind of go back, it's, it's probably worth a little bit of a trip through history um, because uh, I think, you know, we're, we're doomed to repeat it if we don't continue to go back and look at these studies. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, is there any evidence that the cardiotoxicity exists as a late adverse effect? It mostly comes from younger patients and patients treated for either breast cancer or lymphoma. So this is one of these, these seminal studies published in Blood in 2007 that looked at almost 1,500 survivors of Hodgkin's lymphoma who were um, uh, uh, kind of followed for uh, upwards of 20, 30, uh, 35 years actually um, after their diagnosis and treatment. And there was a kind of clear and unambiguous connection between use of mediastinal radiation and subsequent risk of MI, angina, CHF, and valvular disorders. Anthracyclines also increase this risk as well. So again, radiation is not the only player here, but it's also highly age dependent. So, you know, if you hit that sweet spot of uh, being 21 to 40 years old at diagnosis when you get treated, um, and then you have use of mediastinal radiation, there's a pretty significant increase in the risk of cardiac events later in life. So a little bit of a, uh, a double-edged sword. You beat your cancer, radiotherapy was a clear component of beating your cancer, but then you, you, you live to suffer the late adverse events. Same thing for breast cancer, this is a relatively uh, this is a highly cited paper, the Darby, the Darby paper that was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. A little controversial because in this case they did a, basically a, a simulation or retrospective reconstruction of the dose received to patients. So this was not looking at actual doses to patients. But still it was done in a, in a, in a, in a pretty um, well-controlled medical system in Sweden and Denmark where they looked at 2,000 patients treated for breast cancer with radiation over a very long time period. And what they found was that there was a 55% of major coronary or cardiac events 10 years after diagnosis, and it was significantly associated with mean cardiac dose, with to the point where even small increases in mean cardiac dose could lead to significant increases in cardiac events later in life. As we talked about yesterday, though, I do find a little bit of challenge in mean cardiac dose 
uh, perhaps in a single population of patients where you're treating them in a relatively uniform manner that can be meaningful, but across many different populations, as, as I've mentioned yesterday, there's a lot of different ways to get to a mean cardiac dose of four gray or five gray. You can have significant hot spots in one part of the heart with almost no dose to the other, which will give you the same mean dose as a large swath of the heart receiving radiation. Nonetheless, this is pretty, pretty damning radiation, pretty damning uh, data for the fact that there is late adverse events with radiation. So there, I could probably spend the entire hour just going over the old data. That wasn't the point here. That was just to kind of introduce the notion that at least outside of non-small cell lung cancer and looking at patients who live a long time, patients who have an expected long ex uh, survival, such as breast cancer and lymphoma, um, that there is a, a clear association between radiotherapy dose to the heart and increased cardiac events, and those effects could be even seen at relatively low doses. And clearly, that effect is late. And I put that in big red letters just because, as we'll kind of go through the rest of the talk, uh, we'll, we'll start to look and see whether or not those effects can occur or again earlier. So we talked a little bit about the port meta-analysis yesterday. So the port meta-analysis was a study which was looking, or a uh, meta-analysis looking at uh, many different prospective trials. There were older studies looking at the use of post-op radiation after treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. And as I mentioned yesterday, this was a, uh, a kind of a disappointing meta-analysis because while it showed us that we might be able to control regional nodal failure in patients who had high-risk features uh, uh, after resection of uh, locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer, there was a reduction in overall survival with radiation. So there was actually a 5% reduction overall across the board with use of post-op radiation. So whether or not we can control, control their disease is irrelevant. Patients had a higher risk of dying, um, and that's probably a reasonable question, a 5% reduction in overall survival with radiation. Now, of course, there's many different complaints to this. These were older trials. This was a pre-chemotherapy era. Um, out, so-called outdated equipment, where they're using cobalt, single fields, um, really big volumes, large doses, high dose per fraction. There's a lot of reasons why you might say that this is not relevant to today, um, but nonetheless, um, the, the data are what they are. There was, there was a decreased overall survival. Um, and uh, kind of a follow-up subsequent institutional analysis, just to kind of further bury this, this notion of dose a little bit. Um, Mitch Macte and others looked at their own institution and looked at about 200 patients who got post-op radiation, um, and most of these were stage two, three non-small cell lung cancer. A large number were treated because of close or positive margins. And what they found is that there was a, a, a relatively simplistic dose dependency such that higher doses of radiation were, were associated with a higher risk of death from intercurrent disease. So this was just kind of a global metric looking at death from cancer, death not from cancer. Um, and, uh, and while we don't have all the granular reasons why those patients died, um, it is certainly concerning that at the, in the higher dose level that there was a much higher risk of death from intercurrent disease. Suggesting again, this is not just something that occurs in patients with breast cancer and lymphoma, um, but these were some of the early data suggesting this can occur in lung cancer. Um, yet another uh, kind of example of this was a SEER analysis. 6,000 patients, again, with node positive disease who got post-op radiation. And this is intriguing because this starts to show us whether or not if we can imply that there is an improvement in technology over the eras, that if we look at the patients who were treated in the 80s, there was a hazard ratio in favor of worse mortality with use to post-op radiation. So again, the, the black line here is use of post-op radiation. This suggests that in the, in, the, in the 80s when patients were treated, that there was actually worse outcomes if you used post-op radiation. Um, however, you start to lose that as you enter a little bit of the, the early treatment planning era, 3D planning era, um, where now those lines overlap. Certainly, again, not a win for radiation, but maybe we're losing some of that, that inherent um, uh, uh, injury that might occur. Um, and, I, and I mentioned a little bit this before in a little self-advertisement again, I guess. Um, uh, our group and some others then looked at the National Cancer Database and SEER and looked at more modern patients. So yet another step forward towards the uh, late 90s and 2000s um, where we started to look at patients who actually uh, were treated with, with uh, theoretically more modern radiotherapy. 
And then you start to see that actually for patients who have N2 disease, so the risk of the cancer now is significant compared to the risk of the toxicity, then you can start to tease out an improvement in overall survival. This is retrospective data, but nonetheless starts to suggest that you know, if you, if you have this kind of competing balance between toxicity over here and the risk of the cancer killing you over here, that if you can start to uh, um, uh, reduce one over here and then actually improve your outcomes on the cancer side, that you can start to see even small improvements in survival. This is all retrospective data, and as I mentioned yesterday, you know, the, the best data would be prospective. This trial is a lung art trial, uh, Cecile Lee Pichu, is running this or ha did run this. This is completed and we're all anxiously waiting for these, these prospective randomized results in patients who had completely resected N2 disease. So what are we to led to conclude from some of these, these papers that were done about 10 years ago or so? Um, again, older radiation techniques can cause cardiopulmonary toxicity. Again, that effect seems to be somewhat late, not 10, 20, 30 years late, um, but it's, uh, but you know, certainly earlier than we would expect for the lymphoma and breast cancer patients. Um, but something like post-op radiation, for example, um, you, if you select the highest risk patients and use modern radiation, you may be able to obviate some of that. Which brings us back to my favorite study, RTOG0617. I feel like you can't give a lung cancer talk without talking about this. So now we're gonna, we're gonna dive into this, this a little bit different than we did yesterday. So yesterday we just talked about in general, the dose escalation is bad, um, at least unmitigated dose escalation. Um, uh, and again, in this case though, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the subset analyses. Because again, we found that higher dose radiation, 74 gray, did worse than 60 gray in a, in a large randomized trial. But when you looked at the subset analysis, heart dose, specifically heart V5 and V30, was independently associated with worse overall survival. So again, if I were to ask a question, <laughs> decreasing overall survival was associated with increasing heart dose. But let's dive a little bit further into that because this is highly controversial and it's kind of worth knowing the pros and cons of these, these arguments here. So on our pro side for this association, here was a subset analysis that, that Beth Gore and myself and some others did where we went back and we looked at the uh, uh, patients that were treated on RTOGs 0617, hearts were recontoured in a consistent way. And that's a theme we'll talk about here. People were not consistent at all. Most of us in this room probably have some degree of consistency with how we contour, but actually there's quite a bit of variability. And that variability can really affect the V part of your DVH. So if you have a, a wide degree of variability on the volume part of, the, of, the, of, of how you contour, it can affect that. So to, to, to eliminate that, we recontoured all these. Um, look specifically at dose to pericardium, ventricles, atria, and the cardiac apex, and found that, again, there was still a consistent association between, in this case, pericardium V45, so the volume of the pericardium receiving 45 gray or higher. Mind you, this is just a way to contour the heart. So it's the pericardium and everything inside of it. There's nothing unique about it. Um, however, and I think this is important, despite the fact that there was a decreased overall survival with increasing dose to the heart at that high dose level, there was no association with any of those heart metrics and protocol described cardiac, to cardiac toxicity. This is a little bit of a challenge. In fact, not a little bit, it's a big challenge. Because at the end of the day, when you're running an oncology trial and we're all sitting here and you guys have enrolled patients on studies and then somebody comes to you with a form and they say, well, what are the adverse events this patient experienced? As physicians in general, and I would argue as radiation oncologists specifically, we're not that great at assessing cardiac toxicity. So it's not like somebody is sitting there and the patient ended up in the hospital um, and they, they had multi-organ failure that we're sitting there diving through the chart trying to figure out, well, maybe they had a, pulmon a PE, maybe they had a coronary event, maybe they had unstable angina. So physician-reported adverse events are a challenging thing to try and connect to dose metrics, um, particularly within prospective trials. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, in this secondary analysis, heart dose did seem to matter. 
Um, now, our group and others um, have looked at this retrospectively at our own institution. So this, when this paper came out, and then specifically the cardiac component of it came out, where there seemed to be this association between heart dose and survival, um, this just became like a flurry of papers started to come out where everyone looked at their own, anal their own institutions. So this was our own institutional analysis. We again saw if you kind of dichotomize patients and look at the volume of the heart receiving 50 gray or more, the patients who had less radiation dose, so who had a V50 of less than 25%, had significantly improved overall survival compared to those patients who had higher heart dose. Um, unlike 0617, which had a limited ability to go back to the patient records, however, um, our institution and others, we went back and we, we looked in the patient charts and we really looked hard to look for cardiac events. And in fact, what we found um, is that, uh, again, while there was a association between heart dose and overall survival, um, you can start to tease out the fact that there actually was higher, grades, higher rates of cardiac events. And specifically, if you can actually do something to lower cardiac dose, such as IMRT, which is pretty easy to do if you put it in the optimizer, there are actually fewer cardiac events with use of IMRT, again, despite the fact that, um, that this was not an a priori thing. This was just something that was done, uh, uh, you know, about 60% had 3D, 40% had IMRT. So if you're sitting there with a, um, a prior auth rep and you were kind of trying to justify your use of IMRT, we have data from 0617 now that suggests that IMRT reduces rates of pneumonitis that I talked about yesterday. And we also have data from ourself uh, and others that suggest that there's actually a reduction in risk of cardiac events. So again, I might suggest that a good question would be that there's retrospective data to suggest that IMRT can reduce cardiac events. Um, <clears throat> so uh, more data that kind of piles onto that. This was another analysis by Des et al. There was two different papers, Des and Wang, that were published in JCO in 2017 in the same issue. Um, looking at this effect, um, and uh, this was a slightly smaller study, but yet uh, was done on prospective trials. Uh, essentially, all patients were treated with 3D conformal radiation, and they were interested in looking at grade 3 or higher cardiac toxicity. Um, and uh, this was kind of an interesting one because what they looked at as the cumulative incidence of cardiac toxicity over time, and if you had a, a mean heart dose of less than 11 gray that was very low, as that dose got higher, you started to see a cumulative incidence of cardiac toxicity, which seemed to occur in this 36-month time frame. That is very discordant with what we talked about for breast cancer and lymphoma, where some of those findings, those patients were developing disease, you know, 5, 10, 20 years after treatment. Um, and so I think this is actually really nice data because this suggests that the effect of radiotherapy can be much earlier than we expect, uh, particularly in uh, certain patient populations like lung cancer. Um, this was a, another study published in that same issue, another slightly smaller study, but again, they recontoured all the hearts, all the patients were treated with 3D conformal therapy, and they again, they found that there was a 23% cardiac event rate at a median of two years, um, and uh, um, this started to look also at the, uh, the thresholds, 20 gray, 10 gray, uh, and you can see how the lines separate here. When your heart dose was much higher, the probability of those symptomatic cardiac events gets significantly higher. But not all studies suggest that this, this, this uh, uh, you know, um, effect is real. Um, there are, to be fair, and I don't want to sit up here and, and, and just show you one side of the coin, so there are other sides of the coin. Um, here's a study uh, in 2017 that really found no association in heart dose and overall survival um, when they tried to bin heart dose into quartiles. Another negative study specifically looked at a large number of patients, almost 500 patients, um, and found that the associations with survival were things that were more comfortable with, performance status, GTV, and mean lung dose, but nothing in terms of cardiac dose. <coughs> so for me, this means that the, the data is obviously clear. I like this figure here. When doing research, keep in mind there are only two kinds of facts, those that support my, uh, my position and inconclusive. <laughs> So, you know, bringing this to light, again, um, was a nice review article uh, that was just published in the Red Journal. 
that looked at the 22 different studies that have looked at the impact of cardiac dose in non-small cell lung cancer. And I think the title says it all. Is the importance of heart dose overstated in the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer? And I think I see one of the authors sitting in the audience right here, Dr. McGarry. So I hope to convince you that it, perhaps there may be some problems with the, with the way the studies were done. The, the, the seminal argument in this paper is that because they found no consistent relationship between any single dosimetric variable and outcome, meaning that we didn't all find that V5 was important, or V10, or V20, or V40, or V50, or mean dose. Many of the papers, in fact all the papers, essentially reported slightly different associations. And so I know we're not all statisticians in the audience here, but you know, I think we can all kind of recall the fact that if you look at enough variables, you're gonna find a positive result. So if you look at 20 different you know, dose metrics, and you have a P of 0.05, that means about 5% of the time you're gonna five a po find a positive result. So their argument was that perhaps that there's just a need to correct for multiplicity of testing. Maybe we're just finding a, 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 a fallacious kind of association between heart dose um, and survival. Um, we've since published a counterpoint to this. Again, I like, I like creating clever articles or titles, so we're gonna, we're gonna say this is the heart of the problem. No pun intended, right? Um, but you know what I want to show you here is that actually, as I've just shown you, there's not just an association between heart dose and survival, but there's actually cardiac toxicity that we're unearthing. Just because we stink at finding it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There's also a lot of variability in how we contour, um, and then I, I kind of want to end up here in a minute by telling you about some of the non-cardiac toxicities that can exist as well. So maybe it's not just a simple thing of of injuring the heart itself. So let's speak to those challenges of assessing cardiac toxicity because of the data quality. This is a really interesting uh, analysis. They went back to the CONVERT trial. The CONVERT trial was a randomized trial looking at 45 BID versus 60 gray QD for limited state small cell lung cancer. Um, they went back and they recontoured all the hearts on that trial according to a gold standard atlas that they had created. And they found that 76% of the hearts that were contoured in that trial were deviated compared to the standard. So 76% protocol deviation. So if you're gonna just look at the contours that were done on the trial and not look at anything else, then you are already destroying the V part of that DVH because there's a lot of variability. But if they went back and then recontoured everything, they actually found that there was an increase in the dose metrics to the heart. So the V5 and the V30 increased in 80% of the patients if they went back and they recontoured everything consistently. So I think contour consistency and quality is key when doing these kind of large scale dosimetric measures. The other thing is assessing cause of death. Assessing cause of death is really hard. I still remember very specifically being an intern and unfortunately being on call overnight, I know when we used to take overnight on call, right? We don't do that in rag onk anymore. <laughs> but, but being on call overnight and, and somebody would die and they would say, what was the cause of death? Cardiopulmonary toxicity, Cardi who knows, right? I mean, because ultimately most people succumb to that as the final terminal event. So cause of death adverse, you know, looking at the cause of death in the chart or looking at it on the, on the death certificate is really very challenging when trying to connect that to some sort of an event over here. It's a kind of a garbage in, garbage out issue as it relates to data analysis. So it's not readily extracted from the medical record. The other thing is that um, we are very guilty in this field, and, and by the way, this happens the other way as well, on the other side of things like the cardio-oncology group, but we lump toxicity. This heart, as I have learned over the years, it's kind of a complex organ and it's got lots of different things that it does. It's not just a cardiac toxicity. It's really hard to imagine that you could really take a single dose metric and somehow describe uh, a DVH criteria that's going to give you uh, something that is predictive of valvular disease, conduction system disease, pericardial disease, myocardial disease, congestive heart failure. It's just not possible. But what we, get, what we do, because it's hard, is we lump it all together. Um, mind you, the other th th this happens the other way as well. Um, as we started to work with our cardio-oncology colleagues, which by the way, that's now a thing, right? 
So I don't know if you guys have, have worked with this in your own clinics, but there are cardiologists who have now decided, that they've, they've determined that they are now cardio-oncologists. So they are, they're gonna help us deal with these cardiac toxicity. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to collaborate with them and I'm excited, but they actually lump the other way. They'll look at granular cardiac outcomes and then basically say that the patient had radiation, <laughs> right? <laughs> so anyway, so we're both guilty of, of oversimplifying things the other way. How about controlling confound for confounders? You know, at the end of the day, patients die for a number of reasons, um, and uh, so the tumor biology can contribute. Increasingly, obviously, we understand that it's not so simple as to just say that they have non-small cell lung cancer. The patient's comorbidities have a, have a large impact on uh, ultimately whether or not um, these patients succumb to their disease or uh, uh, their comorbidities themselves, or perhaps it's actually a combination of both, right? So, you know, my, my classic example they would be a, a patient who has recurrent non-small cell lung cancer. You've given them definitive chemo radiation, you've made them sick, but their comorbidities then prevent them from receiving the optimal salvage therapy. So it's both an interplay of the comorbidities possibly leading to their death because of their actual cardiac, ev cardiac events, but then also um, because they can't get the therapies they needed. Um, and, I, and again, I, I kind of like this pie graph here. This is almost like the Rumsfeld, you know, the known knowns, unknown known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. So there's a lot of what we really don't know. Uh, this is an interesting paper that was published in uh, Jack. So again, this is one of the challenges too. Uh, our, our journals don't overlap. So this is the Journal of American College of Cardiology. Um, I'm quite certain that, that there's probably nobody in this room that is a subscriber to the Journal of American College of Cardiology. Um, but you know, this is a nice study that was just published that looked at cardiac radiation dose and lung cancer mortality. And this is in the one, two to five years out following start of radiation. And then here, you know, this wouldn't surprise a cardiologist at all. If you said that the patients who had pre-existing coronary uh, uh, cardiac disease, these are the patients who ultimately then have a higher risk of major cardiac events. There's nothing, nothing at all unusual about that. If you then stratify the patients who didn't have any pre-existing coronary heart disease, and you look at the patients who had higher heart dose, you can start to tease out this is a very nicely done study, that there actually is an increase in the risk of, of cardiac events. However, if you take those patients who are actually at the highest risk of heart disease to begin with, and you stratify by heart dose, the, the, the curves overlap. So probably our damage is gonna be the most relevant in those patients who um, we can't hide the fact that they're already getting injury from their pre-existing coronary heart disease. Uh, and, and I think this is important because, you know, one could argue that there's a little bit of nihilism over here. It, it doesn't seem to matter at this point if you already are kind of destined to get those, those adverse events. Um, but certainly for our younger patients, those who are healthier, heart dose seems to matter, even for lung cancer patients. So if there's anything else that I can come at the end of this talk from saying is that we shouldn't have this nihilism for lung cancer and say, oh, well, I mean, the disease is going to kill them. They're probably going to die from cancer anyway. As these patients live longer, there really, is an, there really is an effect. However, if I'm gonna be honest, there are many alternative explanations. I think uh, one of the more um, popular ones, and I think is legitimate, is that heart dose could just be a surrogate for really bad disease. So you might imagine that if you have a really invasive left lower lobe tumor that's invading into the carina, and has a lot of nodal disease, that also is right next to the heart. So perhaps it's not so much the heart disease on its own, but it's just the fact that when you have a lot of heart dose, it's because you're also treating a disease which is very bad. And uh, to kind of you know, uh, uh, substantiate this point, here's a study that was published a couple years ago that showed that the mean heart dose was higher with multinodal multi station disease and level seven disease, again, suggesting that perhaps at least in some patients, that connection between heart disease, or heart dose and worse overall survival is just a surrogate uh, for worse disease. Um, and last but not least, I think one of the more uh, uh, exciting ones is that this may also be an effect with lymphopenia. 
Um, so our group and others have, have looked at this. And um, really interestingly, if you start to look at things like the absolute lymphocyte count, the absolute neutrophil count, or I think more importantly, the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, um, a higher ratio, so higher N to, C, N to L ratio is bad. So that's a surrogate for, for more lymphopenia and worse immune response. Um, what we actually found is that the, uh, uh, there is a clear association between having a, a higher, uh, or sorry, sorry, a worse neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio with survival, PFS, and distant METs. So we talked about this a little bit yesterday, that if you get lymphopenia, there actually may be an association with worse tumor control. Um, and uh, this is really tantalizing because it makes us start to think about all the things we could do to potentially mitigate that. Um, but if you start to believe that, let's take that a next step further. What, do you, what seems to be associated with increased lymphopenia? Well, at least in our study, the heart dose was clearly associated with it. So the one of the strongest predictors of getting more lymphopenia was higher heart dose. And perhaps it's just quite as simple as the heart being a big bag of blood. And you're constantly circulating your lymphocytes through that, so the more you're exposing that. Um, other groups have shown this as well. So Spring Kong and others have shown that the, the, the number of organs that have the highest blood pool, the more radiation dose that you give to that, uh, those organs, more lymphopenia, worse lymphopenia, worse survival. So very likely it's a multifactorial argument. There's probably some component of cardiac disease which occurs. There may be some lymphopenia that goes with it. There may be a surrogate for the disease being just worse disease on its own. Um, it's very likely not just some clear, simple thing that we can sort out with just one simple paper, um, but hopefully I've convinced you that the heart does matter. <laughs> um, and uh, as, uh, as with all matters of the heart, we'll kind of end here. So um, con by conclusion, most studies suggest a correlation between heart dose and cardiac toxicity and heart dose and survival. Um, there is a connection between cardiac toxicity and survival. There are eternity hypotheses. So last but not least, just a class couple of slides here. Um, so there have been a, several publications that have actually shown, um, and this is important because the first thing that I'll be thinking about and the first thing I thought about when I saw all these papers come out was, well, shoot. I mean, photons aren't magic. <laughs> I gotta choose one or the other, right? I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna treat this tumor. What do I do? I have to worry about the lungs and I have to worry about the heart. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Um, and as it turns out, you really can't because some of these papers suggest that actually the cumulative incidence of the dose to the lung and the heart can actually have an interplay as well. So let's get back to our favorite question of protons then. So could we, with advanced technology, could we move past the 3D conformal realm where we have a pretty significant uh, dose to the heart? With IMRT, we can absolutely reduce the high dose to the heart, but at the expense of allowing more of the low and intermediate dose. But protons might be the, the, the answer that allows us to reduce both of that. I want to bring back, again, this important paper, which was a secondary analysis from 0617. I mentioned this yesterday, the Chun paper that suggests that IMRT can reduce the risk of pneumonitis. But also buried in that paper, it showed that heart doses were also lower with IMRT. Same thing was shown here on a 24-patient phase one trial where they looked at IMRT versus 3D, and they saw a reduction in the, redis the, the, uh, the dose to the heart with IMRT. I discussed this paper yesterday in the context of it just being a negative proton trial, meaning that it didn't meet its primary endpoint. Um, but specifically, you know, there were, there were lower low to mid doses to heart. So the advantage of protons are not gonna be in the high dose region, it's gonna be in that low dose region. Um, this was a negative trial. It will be interesting to see in this much, more lar this much larger trial, RTOG1308, which is a large definitive randomized trial of protons versus photons for lung cancer, whether we start to see any improvement um, with the use of protons. Um, and I think, again, back to this Desai paper, um, we can try and reduce the risk through technology. We can try and use IMRT. We can try and use protons. We can try and push on our optimizer. 
But at the end of the day, these patients are going to be at risk of, of adverse events no matter what we do. Um, and I think it is worth mentioning that there are some <coughs> algorithms to think about how to follow these patients over time. So certainly it's not necessarily our responsibility in, in uh, isolation to follow these patients, but just being aware of the fact that we should encourage our patients to continue to do their annual histories and physical exams. They should be screened for, for, for modifiable risk factors, so uh, things like hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease, uh, weight, smoking, um, all these things, ironically, modifying those risk, fa risk factors may have a larger impact than anything we can do with technology uh, in their subsequent long-term outcomes. So uh, I, I think it's important to encourage these patients to get back in and follow with their primary care physician, or if you're fortunate to have a cardio-oncology clinic, follow with that clinic. So last but not least, there is an evolving knowledge of impact of radiation to the heart. We definitely need to improve risk modeling. I will readily admit that there's an unclear balancing of plan prioritization. I put this in here right now because I know the first question I get usually is, okay, what do I do if I have a V20 of 32% and my heart dose is creeping, which one do I push on? Um, and, I, and I would say that there's no clear answer today. There's a lot of data about pneumonitis, and there's an evolving data on cardiac dose. Technology may improve this, but again, I think it's important that we encourage these patients to follow with their primary doctors. So with all that being said, I am done. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, wait a minute. Here we go. In the back. Here, Layton. Good talk, Cliff. Thank you. Oh. Do you have some graphic examples of how we should be contouring the heart? Sure, that's a reasonable question. Um, <clears throat> so there are, uh, I'd say the best, the best thing you could do for consistency's sake is just go to the uh, NRG Oncology or RTOG website. There's, a, there's an atlas for non-small cell lung cancer there. Um, since we don't currently have dose metrics for substructures, I don't see any value in actually independently contouring the atria and the ventricles today. So if you just contour the pericardium and everything inside of it as one structure all the way down from the apex up to the aortic root, then you're going to be safe. Um, uh, however, there may be a future where we actually do need to worry about cardiac substructures. My hope is that by the time we have to worry about that, that all these promised auto-seg algorithms that all the vendors keep promising us will have finally caught up and I can just press a button and be done with it because I certainly have no interest <laughs> in sub-segmenting all that stuff. Well, then nowadays, <coughs> the uh, uh, various permutations of hypofractionation is the fashion du jour is there any information about the dose and you know, those kind of, uh, I don't know, everyday different fractionation coming no, up? No, that's a, that's a fair question. Issue. Yeah, so most of the information that I showed you, in fact, all the information I showed you today was with you know, 1.8 to 2 gray per fraction, standard fractionation. Um, for moderately hypofractionated radiation, there really is no data I'm aware of. For SBRT, there are a few papers that have started to look at the, the, the quote, cardiac dose. But um, again, if you want to say du jour, the kind of fashionable, um, they've already taken it to that next level where they've said, you know, the dose to the atrium or the dose to the, you know, you know, the base of the heart is associated. Again, I don't know what to do with that data. I think it's super interesting. But for example, if I had a patient today who had a left upper lobe tumor, where it was an early stage non-small cell lung cancer and it's the PTV is going to slightly overlap or abut the heart, I'm still going to treat the tumor. You know, I'll try and keep it conformal, but I'm not going to compromise the PTV coverage to make sure that they might not get some event later on because, again, I think the cancer usually wins. Um, so more to come. I, I don't have any good dose constraints for, say, for example, 15 fractions. Yeah. So two obvious risk factors, anemia. They go and they give chemotherapy to these patients for a long time. Mm -hmm. Anemia is very chronic and obviously is a heart stressor. Yeah. Any relationship or has anybody looked? 
Yeah, so it has been looked at um, specifically even just in the chemo alone studies. So anemia uh, is definitely a negative uh, uh, risk factor for survival. For heart disease or um, for just survival? Just general? survival. So actually, it, it becomes like, a, like you said, it, it's, it's a double-edged sword, right? So um, actually, it's funny. We didn't publish this data. <laughs> we should. But we looked at uh, patients who received esophage esophageal cancer treatment who were getting 5-FU-based chemotherapy. And 5-FU is definitely something which is cardiotoxic. And what we found is that it, the patients who were anemic did much worse from a cardiac toxicity standpoint. So that's a good point. So in general, which patients are you typically referring to cardiac on cardio oncologist after lung radiotherapy? Yeah, uh, none right now. Okay. <laughs> and let me, let me I'm gonna, uh, that was a tongue-in-cheek response, but I want to I wanna back it up. <clears throat> Um, our cardio-oncology group was instantly saturated as soon as they started. And it was instantly saturated by breast cancer survivors. So their, their bandwidth went to zero. So the way we resolved that is we actually just literally, I think last week is when it finally opened, we opened up a prospective pilot study looking specifically at use of cardiac rehab and the cardio-oncology program for non-small cell lung cancer patients because we want to generate some data to suggest that it could be beneficial to these patients. Because despite the fact that what I just showed you today, the, in, the, the, the overwhelming bias is to follow late adverse events in patients who have lymphoma and breast cancer and there's very little interest in the lung cancer population. So we're trying to generate that data so we can get our cardio-oncologists to start seeing them. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, great. That's a doozy of a talk for 7 a.m., man. That's a, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> all right. Okay, so let's see if we can get through these and, and get, uh, let's go for 100%. Which of the following is an established manifestation of radiation-induced cardiac disease? Cardiopleural fistula, coronary artery disease, valve thinning, and atrial fibrillation. So which of these is an established radiation-induced cardiac disease? Almost, okay. Well, that's close to 100%. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of made up cardiopleural fistula. <laughs> um, but uh, coronary artery disease is ab absolutely something that we, we, we see in these patients. And um, in terms of the valve toxicity, um, just think about any radiation effect tends to cause fibrosis and thickening. So we wouldn't usually see valve thinning. And as I mentioned earlier at the very beginning of the talk, um, atrial fibrillation is often attributed as being something. So if a patient gets AFib later on, they'll say, oh, well, they got radiation. AFib is just incredibly common, period. And there actually is data that, there's, that suggests that there's no clear connection between radiation and AFib. Uh, back to that initial port meta-analysis. So again, this was the meta-analysis looking at post-op radiation for resected non-small cell lung cancer. Which of the following is true? So remember, older trial, antiquated modalities, didn't use chemotherapy. <laughs> so most studies included trials where chemotherapy was used. Is this true? The rates of non-cancer death were identical between radiation, the, the no RT and the port arms. Most studies included modern radiation equipment, or there was a 5% five five reduction in overall survival with use of post-op radiation. Which of these is true? Okay, excellent. Indeed, there was a 5% reduction in survival with use of post-op radiation. Okay, third question. Back to RTOG 0617. So again, remembering this was high dose versus low dose. 
There was also a cetuximab versus no cetuximab arm. We're going to just forget that even occurred. But it's a high dose versus low dose for non-small cell lung cancer. Which of the following is true of cardiac toxicity? Did we see a compelling increase in the risk of cardiac events in the 74 gray arm, despite the fact that I had mentioned that there was a difficulty in assessing cardiac events? There was an association of worse survival with patients receiving higher heart dose. Dose to the coronary arteries was shown to be most prognostic. And strict dose constraints to cardiac substructures were in the protocol. So back then, we were using cardiac substructure doses. Which of these is true? Almost. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fourth question. There have now been multiple different institutional reviews. I went through a number of these, um, looking uh, at the, in the impact of cardiac dose since that publication of that paper. And so in general, which is true of these studies, all those studies, every study, 100% of the studies, found no association between cardiac dose and rates of cardiac events. Pre-existing cardiac heart disease had no impact on development of cardiac events. IMRT may reduce the risk of cardiac events. Or studies were consistent, and they all found, we all found the same dose threshold for cardiac events. Which of these is true? There we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I needed that. All right. Which of the last question? Which of the following is true regarding publications assessing cardiac toxicity? All cardiac contours were consistently segmented across all the studies. Is that true? Independent cardiac toxicities, toxicities are well described in the medical record. Is that true? Heart dose is clearly separable from location as a variable, so there's no confounding between heart dose and location. Or lymphopenia may be associated with increasing cardiac dose. Which of these is true? Ah, great way to end. All right, outstanding. Thank you very much. I just wanted to remind everybody the food goes away at 9 o'clock because there's a statute that it can only be out for two hours, and it starts at 7. So um, if you want to grab something for now or a little bit later, please feel free to do that before our next talk because uh, I think the next talk ends at 9.10. So. Be really careful with your clicker too. Remember not to push the button until the countdown starts because if you, sorry, if you push the button before the countdown starts and then you don't push it again, uh, it won't record your answer. And I actually just got a red light on mine.
Just, just an announcement before the next talk. So uh, Dr. Herman was talking to us about two of his questions yesterday where he felt like it was, you could argue about you know, the, another answer. So it turns out we can have two answers that were right. So for those two questions, we'll go back and have the two answers be correct. Um, so uh, we'll make that change. So I just want to make a, an introduction for our next speaker, Dr. Khan, who's also on the steering committee and has, I didn't realize until that was up there, has a PhD and an MBA and an MD. So we've had a, a lot of degrees in here today. So he's right now at Banner MD Anderson. Um, and so he's here to talk about uh, immunotherapy, which we know is an up and coming thing because of our other talks and also nanoparticles. And so we welcome him as our next speaker. And you can hear? Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. We got an uh, aloha. <laughs> uh, 
And then I, I, I gave my talk a Hawaiian name, and I hope I can pronounce it correctly. Dave Matson or Leighton could correct me if I got it wrong. Ikawa Mamua Kawa Mahope. Um, and it really is the future is in the past. And I, I hope I'll show some of that to you today when it, in both of these topics. Uh, I'm at Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center. And for those of you that don't know, it was the first strong partnership between Banner Health, a large health system in multiple states, this is really to test this, good it works, <laughs> and, and uh, MD Anderson um, to really develop the cancer program through the entire Banner Health System. And we're in, we've developed throughout most of Arizona so far, and um, now also just added uh, Colorado. So we added a few other mountains that we didn't have before. I'm going to start with the immune system. Um, and I'm not going to give you an overview of the entire immune system or all of immunology. I have to say I was one of the people that studied immunology in grad school and as, as you got into it you hoped you never really had to use this thing in real life because it was so complex and so difficult to figure out. Um, but we do have to use some of it now because uh, I guess I live long enough for some of this to come back and actually potentially be really useful. Right? Um, I want to, when you look at the immune system, I want to draw out two things. You often talk about, and this is true of all of biology, they tend to talk about one or two cells as if that's meaningful. Um, we do a lot of biology within a cell and all the molecular pathways. We look at individual cells and how they interact sometimes in co-culture and other things. But the reality is we're in a complex microenvironment when we're dealing with tumors, right? And we tend to forget that. And all these different cells, the tumor cells, the stroma, the fibroblasts, right? The, the microvasculature, the angiogenic microvasculature, the new microvasculature that's forming, the adipocytes, all these cells are talking to each other, right? Whether it's in contact with one another or releasing cytokines or molecular signals. And if one of these emits a set of cytokines or signals, guess what? That triggers things in the other ones that then cross talk to other ones. So we're in a complex microenvironment. So whenever we really are talking about the immune system or really anything in biology, we always have to remember that we're really talking about the interactions of all these cells. And this becomes particularly true a lot of times when we think of immunology in that we tend to focus in on the individual immune cells and really they're cross-talking all the time with everything else, right? Um, so that's one concept that I just wanted to get across. The other concept is we constantly, t and this is something that may be good to remember for later, is this concept of innate versus adaptive immunity. And just in a simple way, for a long time in immunology, you think of cells that are innate, meaning they're sitting there already in your body, and they already have an ability to, to glop things, eat things. Most of these things are antigen-presenting cells. They destroy things themselves, so kind of your innate immune system. And you have your adaptive immune system, right? And the adaptive immune system is really, really your B cells and T cells, right? And they have the ability, essentially, if you've got a B cell and it recognizes an antigen, it'll make a lot more of itself if it's a, a non-self antigen, right, that it recognizes. And so a B cell adapts. It'll move, like adaptive radiotherapy. It'll make much more of itself and amount to immune response against a specific bacteria or something like that. T cells the same way. If it's triggered the right way, a T cell will then become activated become a mad angry T cell and go ahead and kill stuff, right? Like the Hulk. So adaptive immunity are really these B cells and T cells, right? And all the other cells have important immune functions, growing in important immune functions, right? But we call them more your innate immunity. They're not changing, modifying themselves to carry mount immune responses the same way. What happens with radiotherapy? And, and for decades, we've been giving radiotherapy. And again, Ralph Wechselbaum comes up and Sam Hellman at the University of Chicago, they've got, they had a, a lot of work on these concepts of we're giving radiation dose, we're killing cells right, left, and center through either through apoptosis, but largely through necrotic cell death. We should be creating antigens everywhere, right? And we should be provoking immune responses. But for decades now, we haven't really been able to, largely, we've not been able to provoke these immune responses in the body with radiotherapy, right? So the thought was, again, you'd hit a tumor with radiotherapy, you'd spill antigens, those antigens will be presented 
to the antigen presenting cell, in this case a dendritic cell, right? And then the dendritic cell, right, will take those antigens and present them to a T cell down here, right? And if it's in the right context, it'll activate that T cell and the T cell will go kill stuff, right? So again, part of that adaptive immune response, B cells and T cells, in this case, the T cell will go kill things. So we are creating all these antigens that can be presented to the immune cells, yet we're not seeing brisk immune responses against tumor. And again, for decades, we've tried to isolate the T cells that are in the tumor, right? We've had some success a little bit now with that with CAR T cells and others, but you know, taking activated T cells, the T cells we think are the most likely to kill tumors, that hasn't been a slam dunk either. That's worked once in a while in an odd patient, you know, these things. So, so when you think of solid tumors that most of us treat, this hasn't come to fruition. And why might that be? And, and I, I think we have an analogy, a little bit of analogy from racing. I'm not a r racer, but, <laughs> um, and that's the brakes. We're, we're always thinking of driving the immune system, creating antigens, making the immune system go like crazy, right? But the immune system is very good at saying stop, at slamming the brakes down and shutting itself down. In fact, if it didn't do that, we'd all be having anaphylaxis and, and autoimmune reactions right, left, and center right now, right? So the immune system brakes were critical, and they were so critical that what, what, is, what the modern data is showing is that these brakes to the immune system or what has prevented radiotherapy and potentially other therapies from really being able to drive the immune system the way we want it to. The immune system has just shut down, right? And so to present it again a, a, a little different way, here's the immune system on no breaks, right? The antigen presenting cell is presenting antigens to, the, to this T cell and activating the T cell and the T cell is going off to kill stuff, right? But there's this little molecule here, CTLA-4. Think of it as the break, right? And remember that CTLA-4, it's a good one to remember. That one is one of the breaks of the immune system. If the break engages, right, from this antigen-presenting cell, right, the T cell breaks, right? So if you engage the break, the T cell breaks. <laughs> And it's not driving re immune reactions anymore. It's not killing stuff. It's not becoming activated and carrying out this immune response that you wanted. So there are molecules, right, sitting there, right on the T cell itself that say, I'm not going, I'm gonna break, right? Now, if you make an antibody against the break, right? So if ilumimab is an antibody against the break, against CTLA-4, right? You've taken the break offline, right? All of a sudden this T cell is activated and can go kill stuff, all right? This is mostly what I wanna get across today because out of the entire immune system that we've looked at, I feel this has been our biggest breakthrough and what has caused so much um, interest again in the immune system is we finally learned how to take the break off the immune system and do it with an antibody that binds up and takes the break off. And once you've taken the break off, we can start driving the immune system, right? Whether that's in combination with chemotherapy producing antigens, or I think radiation therapy producing antigens like crazy um, from tumor cells, we can take the breaks off and allow the immune system to run. And there's a whole series of these breaks. The immune system doesn't just have one. Um, and the two we've spent the most time and you've probably read the most about and seen the most papers on are these two the CTLA-4 break, right, and the PD-1 break, right? And we have ipilimumab, right, and nivolumab, right, that, uh, that bind to these, right, that take the breaks, shut the breaks down, and allow the immune system to go, allow the T cells to become activated and start killing stuff, right, and activate other things. And in fact, it turns out there's more of these inhibitors right, of the immune system, sitting there right on the T cell, saying shut down, don't work. But I want you to focus on these two for today. These two are good ones to know because these are the ones that are in the literature over and over again are CTLA-4 and PD-1, right, both of those. And again, you've got a whole host of immune activators 
I have to say, there's been quite a bit of work trying to activate the immune system, not very successfully, but now that's coming back into vogue a little bit, as long as you can control the break and take the break off with these antibodies, right? Then you may have a shot of activating as well, whereas before we couldn't. Th there was a New England Journal paper that really brought this home with ipilimumab, right? Looking at patients with metastatic melanoma, right? And for the first time, you were able to begin to see improvement in overall survival in melanoma. And, the, and if you were not old, if you're just a few years old in medicine, melanoma, metastatic melanoma was a deadly disease. And now we're getting 70% potential in some of these patients cure rates, cure rates um, by taking the breaks off the immune system and allowing you to tackle melanoma wherever it is using your body's own immune system. And the other point is, besides ipilimumab, the one we've talked about against CTLA4, right? There's nivolumab, the one against PD-1, the other break, <laughs> the other big break that's been studied. And there's been, again, another New England Journal paper showing that if you combine the two, if you take off two breaks, you do better than if you take off one break, all right? And again, you allow the T cells to become activated and kill stuff, all right? So, We've got a whole host of targets now to begin thinking about the immune system. We've got, as I've showed you before, a lot of breaks. And we've got some antibodies able to take some of these breaks offline, right? And we're beginning to play with a lot of other molecules, right, that bind at the activators and can activate the immune system, potentially. So now you can imagine playing with these things um, in a way you hadn't before. Right, so, and you've got a bunch of molecules on the dendritic cells that, or the cells that present antigens, right? So if you get a tumor and you would kill it with radiation, you can present antigens. There are ways to activate these as well and help these work better. So now you've got a couple of players of the, of the immune system, things that present to the T cells. You've got the T cell itself, but the big breakthrough is here right now. And that's where most of the money is and what we're talking about. Um, the other thing I'll just point out is but through the lung cancer talks, you, had, you heard a lot about not PD-1, the break, but you heard a lot about PD-L1, right? L just is ligand, right? So if you've got a receptor, you've got a ligand that binds to the receptor, right? And what if tumor cells learn really fast? Boy, we can make a lot of that ligand. We can bind to the break and shut it down we can activate the break, right? So, so when I talk about this interplay, tumors are not idiots, right? Well, we might say it's by evolution of the tumor cell, and, but tumor cells make PDL1. The ligand binds to the break and activates the break, turns the break on, right? So, there's, so you've seen in lung cancer some success going against the ligand. <laughs> Keep the ligand away, kind of going against estrogen instead of the estrogen receptor right? That kind of thing, same kind of concept. So you've seen a way to go against the ligand, and that's been successful, again, preventing the tumor cell from shutting down the break, in this case, right? So these are, these are when you hear about these words, hopefully CTLA-4 and PD-1 will make some sense. These are breaks, and we've got things that shut them down, shut off the breaks. We've got ligands, and if we can get the ligand away, then the break can't be turned on, that kind of thing, right? And there's a whole host of trials with this coming out now. This is not something, we'll have a lot more data on this going into the future. I just put some of them in the talk that you can look at. But basically, more of these agents that I showed you that are coming in that'll take off the breaks, more molecules that'll stimulate the T cells, right? Activators while you're taking off the breaks, right? To try again, drive the T cells to become very activated and start killing stuff, right? And triggering killing of cells, right? And there's, there's work on innate immunity molecules that can then trigger the other part of the immune system, the antigen-presenting cells, the dendritic cells, the NK cells, the ones that set the innate part, not the adaptive part, the B and T cells, right? So, and there's a lot of work in combinations of these things and in combinations with known agents, right? Known, known chemotherapies. So what about radiotherapy again? We always thought radiation should be spilling things and, cause, and causing uh, immune responses, right? Would it make sense now that we can present antigens like crazy with radiation, can we now present them to cells that have the brakes off, 
right? And there is some work in mice that, that uh, Sylvia from NT done um, um, years ago now that, that, again, showed she could do that. She could take a, a breast cancer cell that did not really provoke immune responses, and by adding, taking the brakes off the system with ipilimumab, she could add radiation therapy and all of a sudden start driving immune responses against that breast cancer cell, right? So breast cancer cell in mice, hit it with radiation therapy. In the setting of ipilimumab, where the brakes are taken off, all of a sudden you're driving an immune response and provoking an abscopal response against metastases. Abscopal meaning away from where you're delivered, away from the primary. So you're hitting that primary, you've got the brakes off the system, the T cells get activated, they go all over the body and kill, abscopally kill metastases. So you're driving cure in breast cancer where you didn't drive it before, right? Because you're taking the brakes off the immune system. The same type of thing was then seen in a patient, right? Um, abscopal effect again, um, and this is a, a red journal paper and then New England journal paper, again, provoking an abscopal effect, in this case, melanoma with radiotherapy. So using radiation therapy in the presence of, of, of a, um, immune blocker or, or something that would take the brakes off the immune system and being able to draw, draw, drive immune responses. Right, so Nancy Lee done some of this and others have done this. So again, when we think of the immune system now, we're thinking of a T cell that is not quiet. The T cell is very active. And when you hit it with radiation, all sorts of molecules change in these tumor cells. Tumor cells don't sit quietly, right? You kill some of them, but then uh, all these, these uh, heat shock and other types of responses are triggered because the cells want to live, right? So, and one of the things they do, as I showed you before, is they can make ligand to shut down the immune system. That's one way to live, turn on the brake, <laughs> bind to PD-1 and turn the brake on with, with your ligand. But they, they also affect all the other cells. Tumors will actively try to live right, you know, while, you give, while you're going at them. So our ability to take the brake off has helped to tip that balance. So we could take the brake off, we could spill antigens and we could take and we could begin to go after the tumors in our complex microenvironment, go after tumors in the way we couldn't go after them before, right? Um, and when we think of doing this with radiotherapy, the thing I want to get across here was just that we have a series of host characteristics, the genetics, the biology, the innate immune system, right? If you have no lymphocytes, if you have a disease and you have no T cells, you're never gonna activate them, <laughs> right? So, so we have your innate immunity that's important to consider when you wanna drive immune responses, right? We have the tumor itself, which can do many different things depending on the tumor that we have to consider. And we have the type of therapy we're using that we have to consider for driving these things. Um, one thing you'll hear with radiotherapy, um, and I show this just really to say again, it's a complex microenvironment, but when we give radiation, we kill a lot of the tumor cells. Again, we should be spilling antigens that can then pre be presented to T cells. In the setting of ipilimumab or nivolumab, we've taken the brakes off so those antigens can now drive a response. And I would think a large future for radiotherapy should be here, should be this focused um, delivery of radiotherapy in the setting of molecules that take the brakes off the immune system in order to drive immune responses against tumors. Right, and, and I think we'll see a lot of that. I know we'll see a lot of that going into the future. One, one thing I've heard a lot of medical oncologists say um, is that, oh, well, you're probably killing the, the T lymphocytes, the most important lymphocytes when you give radiation to the tumor because you're killing those tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, right? So we, and, and that may be true. You may be killing some of those tumor infiltrating lymphocytes with radiotherapy, although you know you don't kill all of them right? <laughs> You're definitely spilling antigens and driving an immune response. But I, I would say chemotherapy goes everywhere <laughs> and kills your tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, right? At least we're focal on some of the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And you can imagine designing trials in the future, especially in palliative patients that are metastatic, right? We're used to getting our entire radiation dose around the entire volume, right? Because we have to shrink that entire volume. You can imagine in a metastatic patient, you don't have to do that. If your goal is to trigger abscopal effects, to trigger the immune system, maybe we just need to deliver focused radiation, maybe to parts of that tumor, right? Maybe to a lymph node somewhere that's easy to get to. 
you know, filled with tumor or a mass somewhere, that we can deliver radiotherapy to triggering immune responses, triggering immune responses that could then potentially cure patients in a way we couldn't do that before. So it's a different way, thinking of radiotherapy not as having to get around it and kill every tumor cell, but get there in enough of the tumor to trigger immune responses, right, that can then cure patients. And I think that will be a future of radiotherapy as well, is this treatment of tumors differently than we treat them today. Um, and I think, and the, there's a whole host of things you have to consider when we get into this into the future with radiation. How, what's the best um, spacing of the radiation? before we give the, immuno the uh, immunotherapy agents, the ones that take the breaks off the immune system, after, during, what's better to use, conventional versus hypofractionated, right? Several of us think hypofractionated is probably the way to go because you get the most necrosis of vasculature, the most necrosis of cells um, with, with the hypofractionated type of dose. It's very focused, and then you could drive the immune responses again that way, but there's some data for some conventional fractionation as well, right? And those things are being worked out in mouse models. Do we want to irradiate parts of the tumor, not the whole tumor? Do we really want to make our goal to drive um, immune responses, especially in metastatic patients, um, right? And then how does that interact with the host, the gut microbiome, all types of other things that are in the host? And there's now a whole series of trials that are running with radiotherapy, right? And these immunotherapy agents, most of the immunotherapy agents being the ones that, again, take the breaks off the immune system. That's where most of our, our work is. But you've got some that are also working with other molecules that drive the immune system as well and drive other components of the immune system. Again, I think they'll work better in the ones that take the breaks off the immune system. All right? So I'm going to end there for the immune system. And I just want to talk a little bit about what, what I mentioned before, which was um, what if we look back in time and I wanted to first start, just show very quickly um, um, somebody that um, Charles Maitland, um, this person, right, who back in the 1700s, right, um, went over to the, during the smallpox outbreaks, right, taking some lessons that he'd heard from Turkey, right, um, went over to the English ambassador's children, <laughs> children, right, so probably the one person worse to their ambassador than Trump, I guess, was this guy, right? And then, uh, and then uh, took a little bit of erupted smallpox stuff from the, and injected the children, put that on the children. They developed a rash, an immune response, and were then protected um, from smallpox, right? So not something we'd probably get through an IRB today, um, but it was done in the old days, right? So. Um, so if you look back here in the, um, in the uh, again, about that same time period, just a little bit after that, 1893, we have Coley's toxin, where you're taking essentially a, a reaction that's a bacterial reaction, right? Taking that Coley's toxin from that, from that bacterial reaction and all the milieu there and trying to inject that into patients with sarcoma to try to provoke an immune response in sarcoma. And that worked for, a, that had a, a, a time where it seemed to be useful in the clinic and then eventually waned, right? Because it wasn't, it wasn't perfectly useful in those. But it was tried, trying to use the, driving the immune system, you know, fr from bacteria, try activate the immune system, probably with more than just the bacterial antigens, also using the, the molecules that were part of that immune system to then go against cancer. And in 1908, in the British Medical Journal, right? Success using radiotherapy in lymph nodes, in the lymphatic glands, right? To again try drive the immune system, right? And go against cancer, right? So, ikawa mamua, ikawa mahope, right? Um, the future is in the past. So when we, now I'm gonna switch gears, I'm gonna talk about nanotechnology, another kind of future therapy that is, that, is, that is everywhere now. Um, it's, in, it's in your earphones, it's in your clothing that you're wearing, it's designing jets, right? All types of things. Um, and also entering a large entrance in the role into cancer therapies, right? Um, and that's gonna be increasing. And again, if you look at the way we've treated cancer in the past, it's basically been surgery, right? Cut it out with, with good development, actually 
before a lot of the surgery, we actually had radiation <laughs> um, using radiotherapy um, to treat cancers, right? Or using chemotherapy, right? To go after cancer and try to kill cancer cells. And that's been the mainstay of cancer therapy, still is for most of what we do, other than kind of novel therapies coming again with going after antigenic microvasculature, going after the immune system, and the new thing I'll describe, which is nanotechnology, which is development of novel devices to potentially go after tumors. And if we look at cancer worldwide, <coughs> cancer soon will be the number one killer worldwide. It used to be infectious disease, um, but we've got an aging population around the world. People are living longer worldwide, and what you're seeing now is cancer is emerging soon, very soon, as the number one killer worldwide. Um, different types of cancers, depending on what country you're in, but a large, um, a large amount of cancer, right? Um, for nano devices or nanotechnology, essentially what I want you to remember, it's very important to remember this, is that nanoparticles are designed as being between one to 100 nanometers in size, right? Um, you'll hear other definitions allowing up to 1,000 that was allowed in order to allow certain devices into large grants and centers and the other things. But the, the classical definition and the most accurate definition of a nanoparticle is one to 100 nanometers in size, right? And at that nano size, materials become different. You know, um, um, materials you can use to make planes have extreme strength but can bend like they've never bent before. Cloth, you know, can bend. Very hard materials turn soft and can be made into cloth and other things. Computers. It's at, and at, at that one to 100 nanometer range, you can have quantum effects occurring as well as the, the bulk chemistry that we've seen before, right? So you can, you, when you do quantum computing, which is coming on pretty fast now, um, they're beginning to develop the first quantum computer calculations are starting. Um, you're, you're dealing with things in this range because you can take advantage of quantum effects and materials have properties that are very different. They can superconduct better, bend better, do things at high tensile strength, right? So the idea was, could we use, make and develop these, some of these nano devices, these, these molecules, these new materials, in order to go at bio biology in a way that we couldn't do it before with um, our current materials? And a, a few of the things I wanted to get across from some of these nano devices is just to give you a survey of some of them, right? So remember the size, one to 100 nanometers, right? The other things, that, and then you can see that these nano devices, this will be a busy slide because there's a lot on here, but I wanted to finish most of my talk on this slide, <laughs> or most of, your, most of the future things you'll get on this slide, right? Is um, one type of nano device were quantum dots, which are essentially batteries, <laughs> cadmium, stuff used in batteries. But if you make them into small nanoparticles, these, uh, some of these molecules can fluoresce, and they fluoresce extremely brightly so brightly that you can tag them to peptides or other things, right, small molecules, and you can tag molecules in cells, and you can literally watch macromolecules in cells in real time move along axon, move <laughs> along. So you're starting to watch molecular machinery carry out its function in cells in real time because you can see the little fluorescent molecule and where it's going and how it's moving, right? So for the first time, You've got fluorescence that's so bright that you can actually track individual, individual macromolecules and watch the cells carry out their functions in a way you couldn't do that before, right? You can watch um, axons being built. You, um, you can watch things moving through axons. You can watch things um, actually with the microtubules. You can watch them disassembling microtubules and reassembling at the other side because you can tag them with these fluorescent probes. You can use multiple different colors and you can actually watch cells carry out their functions. That's a whole biology now that's been started with the nano devices. These are, are magnetic nanoparticles. You can imagine making nanoparticles that you've tagged with chemotherapeutics or other things, and then sticking a magnet in the right place and pulling it towards the organ where you want it, then delivering radiotherapy um, with your radio sensitizer in the right place. Um, but even more than that, if you've got certain paramagnetic devices, right, nanoparticles, that could be combined with MRI. So if you've got that device and you have an MRI and you switch you know, in an MRI you can switch the polarities. You switch the polarities, these devices will heat. So if you can take a nano device, that's, and they've developed this with shell devices, you can have the nano device, target. if you can target it to the right spot, right, either with a target ligand or an agent or something, or it goes through the angiogenic microvasculature, 
you can then apply an MRI in an MRI device. You can then switch the fields in the MRI device and all of, the, all of a sudden the MRI device becomes a killing machine to kill tumor, right? Instead of imaging, you're using the nanoparticle in the right spot to generate heat and kill, right? So combination of nano devices with almost every imaging modality that currently exists can turn that imaging modality into a treatment modality, right? And, that, and I think the people best, um, with the best abilities to handle that world, that world of, of biophysical therapeutics are radiation oncologists. And I think our field will morph in the future from radiation oncology because that's one biophysical therapy. I think in the future we'll be using ultrasound, MRI, all types of imaging modalities besides radiation, right? In order to kill when we combine those with nano devices. Right. Um, Microfluidics, a whole other field rose up out of this. You can make nano-sized pores, nano-sized chambers. You have to do this in a special room wearing a space suit because li even a little dust will clog all these pores and channels. But you can build devices like computer chips, right, um, where you can carry out a whole series of reactions on tiny, tiny amounts of fluid, right? So we've gone from having to take huge amounts of blood out of patients, right? Evacuate the entire body of its blood, right? So you can do a few tests, right? To taking 100 microliters or less, injecting it into these chips and carrying out all types of reactions, right? So microarray chips, tiny input of tissue, few cells off a swab, and you can carry out multiple, multiple, multiple reactions in these reactions, nano-sized wells, nano-sized chambers and carry out multiple reactions. You can inject a cell, lyse the cells. Um, in another chamber, chew up the, the protein. In another chamber, chew up the lipid. Leave yourself with DNA and RNA in the final chamber that you then do analyses on. So you can build these devices now that allow you to take very, very small amounts of input, blood, cells, other tissues, carry out multiple reactions at very, very low concentrations, right, and get a readout in the end. The readouts, they developed devices like cantilevers and nanowires, right? You could imagine having a nanowire. Um, and if the nanowire tips a little bit down or a little bit up, you can detect that change in the electrical signal of the nanowire. So you could have nanowires coated, say, with a whole host of antibodies, take a few cells, apply them, the, you know, lyse them, apply them on the nanowires. And if your protein is there, right, the antibody will bind it and it'll flip the nanowire. Right? So tiny amounts of cells, lyse them, and with these little chambers containing multiple nanowires, each, with, each of them with detectors for individual different proteins, you can start detecting proteins at very small levels. So cantilevers and nanowires, these other things are, are devices that are being built that allow you to detect very small amounts of tissue. It's to the point now where you could breathe into, you've seen, I think you've seen these articles, you can breathe into some devices now and detect whether the RAS mutation is present, right? In the, in the small amount of, of breath that you've given up there, right? And so you can use that, they're beginning to use that now for lung cancer detection, RAS mutant mutations of lung cancer. In the urine, can we now detect mutated genes in the <coughs> urine, right? As people pee. So at home, can we begin to pick up the early, early, early stages of cancer before you can even see it in an image? Right, and then begin to start working on patients early. The, the, the trouble there will be finding the cancer after you've found it, <laughs> essentially. All right, so there are many nanoparticles now entering um, the world, and, but, but most of these are still liposomes and polymers, right? And um, liposomes we're very used to, right? Lipid bilayers that you can make into a circle. You can attach things to the surface and you can put things inside them. And polymers, we'll talk about for the rest of the talk, um, which is all polymer types of devices. So I think I've covered most of the things you need for the end. Um, remember that. Remember that you can do many, 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 many things with these nano devices, detecting small amounts of things, interacting with other imaging modalities to carry out reactions, detecting very small amounts of tumor, many, many, many things you can do with these nano devices. And we'll focus in on polymers. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here. Um, one thing is if you enter the world of nanomedicine, you end up dealing with people that don't speak the same language. That's really what this develops. So when you enter this field, we used to think it was a big deal talking to a pharmacologist or something, or a biologist, God forbid. But here you're talking to computer science people, you're talking to bioengineers, 
you're talking to chemists, you're in a whole different world of biophysical sciences when you enter, when you enter nanomedicine. And there are people that are highly specialized, but they do not understand one another. So that's the, the impetus for forming nanotechnology teams was to begin to bring together large cadres of people that were in very different sciences that could then talk to one another. And it's unbelievable what you can do. Like, like we, you would want to measure or detect something, the engineer will say, yeah, I can build a machine that'll do that. For biologists, it wouldn't exist, it'll never exist, and you can't buy it, it's like $500,000. But you're working with a team of engineers, they'll build you something that'll detect something you want. You know, like in Sandia Labs, we had somebody build us something to detect a nano device. Nothing existed that could do it, that type of thing. So when you start teaming with professionals and you begin to understand each other a little bit and then trust one another in their specialties, what they can and cannot do, you can start growing and building nanomedicine the way you couldn't before. We assembled a large team at two institutions. One institution was at University of Michigan when I was there. Um, and, and, and you can relax now. This is the fun, for me, the fun part of the talk. It's just stuff we've done. And I'm just gonna spend the last few minutes really just going over some of the things we explored over the last 20 years in nano devices. And when these nano devices had first come out, and I was at University of Michigan, a chemist wandered into my room and said, we've got these new things called nano devices, but we don't, want it to do it. we don't know what to do with them. And we started looking at it saying, well, maybe they could go through angiogenic microvasculature. It seems like it's about the right size and maybe we could get um, them into tumors and if we could load them with radiation therapy, maybe we could deliver radioisotopes. If we can load them with chemotherapeutics, maybe we could deliver chemotherapy in a way we couldn't deliver it before. So we began at a time when people just had nano devices and were starting to look at them in cells and see if they went into cells, we, we said, let's start developing nano devices and see if we can go into animals. So we worked with a dendroman nano device. It's a perfectly symmetrical polymer, right? You polymerize this up, and this particular, these particular devices, you could attach things to the surface for contrast, for therapy, for other things, and you can embed them with metals. And the metals could be radioactive, again, for therapy or for imaging or other things. And when we first started out, nobody knew where these devices were going, how toxic they were. So we built a series of devices of different charges and then of different <coughs> sizes. We found ways to take the dendromers and polymerize them up bigger when they got to their limit to link them together so they could be even bigger. And we started out just by measuring and, and seeing whether we could measure where they went. And because we could embed gold into these devices, the gold could be radioactive and we could quantify these nano devices ex in extremely small amounts. So unlike others where they hadn't, didn't have the ability to quantify and they could just look, there's a lot of nano device in there, maybe in a fluorescent probe. We were able to give highly quantitative data in all the organs that nano devices went into. We were able to develop some pharmacokinetic models then on these devices, changing simple things, charge and size of nano devices. Did it change how they distribute in the body? And, we, and working together with the pharmacokinetic groups at, 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 at um, SUNY in Buffalo, at Buffalo, we developed essentially models um, that would begin to explain how nano devices of different charges and different sizes would move through the body. And we were able to replicate the way they did in reality. And then we were able to predict um, some devices that we had not made. We were able to predict where they would move. And, and so this, this brought across the concept, which is now being explored since, on looking at chemical characteristics, size, charge, other characteristics of nano devices. Can you model those and begin to predict where these devices will move through the body to then help governing future therapeutics and other things? The other, the other concept we thought of because we left that, because we're more interested in this, was can we deliver a nano device to a tumor, right? Um, again, these are nano size, small macromolecular agents. Could we try to deliver them to a tumor? We started with a KB cell model and again, nobody had really done this at the time we did this, but we started with a tumor that you could grow. Uh, th that tumor had a lot of folate receptor on its surface, much more than the rest of the body. And we injected the tumor into mice. We then made a nano device that had folate on the surface to bind to the folate receptor, right? Folic acid receptor, right? And we then injected that into the blood of the mice and then isolated all the organs to look at where the device went. Yes, and, and what we're, we were able to show that yes, if you don't have folic acid on the device, folate, it doesn't pick up in the tumor or in the, in the organs. If you have folic acid on there, you could bind to the tumor in much higher levels. And if you added free folic acid to compete away 
um, to bind up all the receptors so that your device couldn't get there, you could compete off the receptors, the receptor, the uh, device. So we were able to show specific binding to our receptor of, of a folic acid um, device. And then the next step was we attached methotrexate to the same device, a chemotherapeutic. Now if you can target a nano device, can you target a nano device with a chemotherapeutic? And we were able to show that if you just inject low, um, no tumor or your nano device with no methotrexate on it, tumors will grow. If you have a low dose of methotrexate, tumors will grow. If you have a high dose of methotrexate, you can slow the tumor growth, but the mice die, right? But if you take a low dose of methotrexate that did nothing, but you put it on a targeted molecule, targeted nano device going to the tumor, right, and binding specifically, the mice will live and you could shrink the tumors and we showed improved survival. So that was the first kind of proof of, one of the, one of the first proof of principles that you can take a nano device you can build one that can target tumors specifically, you could attach chemotherapeutics, you could treat tumors, but also preserve the normal tissue. This is all about therapeutic ratio in, in these animals, right? Um, you're not gonna treat patients with folic acid, so that, that didn't move in the clinic. But again, we're, we're more about proof of principle. This is imaging devices, and the concept for these types of studies was, could you take a nano platform, in this case, the dendromer device, and by putting different metals in it, or attaching molecules to the surface, could that same nano device image inside of cells, right? Image cells, right? Allow you to image tumors, <laughs> cell, cells of tumors, and image in vivo. So could the same platform with slight manipulations, the same nano platform, allow you to image at many different sizes, right? From the whole animal all the way down to intercellularly. And if you embedded gold in the nano devices, you could see them on transitional electron micrograph. You could look intercellularly at where these devices went. If you attached, we attached a molecule RGD that bound to the angiogenic microvasculature. We showed we could specifically bind, competed off with free RGD, right? That we could indeed visualize. Um, this is a cell that was not an endothelial cell. Um, this is an endothelial cell um, um, triggered to make a lot of the alpha B beta three molecule that RGD binds to, and we're able to visualize the, um, the nano device inside of the cells with a fluorescent marker. And if you inject it into a mouse, right, we were able to isolate the tumor from the mouse um, that had angiogenic microvasculature, right, and show that again, the PBS doesn't light up the tumor, you know, the device all by itself doesn't light up the tumor, but the device um, with RGD right, with the targeter on there, lit up the tumor that had the angiogenic microvasculature on it very strongly. So we were able to go from, so far, from inside of a cell to cells to seeing it in the whole animal, right, um, almost, isolated cells in the whole animal. And then we went into the whole animal, we used a, a different construct <laughs> of the device that allowed us to image with fluorescence um, the nano device. And we were able to see in mice um, that had the um, and that had tumors on them, right? Um, strong tumors on them that we were able to image image that this going into the um, RGD triggered. Uh, sorry. So if you added the nano device that did not have the targeting agent on it, the RGD, right? Not present in the angiogenic micro. You know, tumors have angiogenic microvasculature. And if you add, add the nano device that doesn't have that little target to the angiogenic microvasculature, it does not light up. But if you add it with the targeting device, uh, targeter on the nano device, you could light up the tumors. And you could light them up about, you saw there was a four-fold increase in the, in the targeted nano device into tumors that had angiogenic microvasculature compared to the, the non-targeted device. That's what we were able to show here. And the, um, and that correlated, we were able to label these devices and get exactly the same numbers. So um, through Michigan and, and through Roswell Park um, Cancer Institute, this research was conducted on dendromers, showing that we could look at them and begin to analyze how chemistry might affect biology, and then look also then at how we can image through multiple modalities and that we could treat tumors with specific targeted nano devices. And then moved to British Columbia and Vancouver. Um, the trouble with dendromers is they're very hard to synthesize very hard to make, but with, um, we designed a new nano device that you can make overnight, a one-step synthesis, micellar formation, very homogeneous. And I'm just gonna, 
running out of time because I talk too much, but I'll just say that this was shown to be a very safe device. You had to go to very high levels of the device in order to, to, uh, to uh, get any toxicity. It didn't affect blood parameters at all. It was safe in all tissues. We were able to load it with docetaxel, which is a thousand fold stronger than paclitaxel. So very small amounts of the chemotherapeutic agent could be loaded into the nano device. We're able to kill all types of tumors. It didn't matter whether you load it or not. Um, and interestingly, normal cells seem to be protected um, 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 from the nano device. And there's a little picture of this. And when we did biodistribution studies of this nano device, we saw that we were able to concentrate it in tumors in levels that were similar to a Braxane, a molecule that you treat um, tumors with. And, and we've, we've developed a model now with pancrea uh, pan one with pancreatic cancer. And these, these are molecules very similar to a Braxane, an albumin molecule that goes through the angiogenic microvasculature into tumors. And, uh, and the nano device that was synthetic that we made now does the same thing. Only that molecule we can play with. Um, and so we were able to show that we could make a nano device again that was safe. We could bind it with a um, docetaxel, an interesting chemotherapeutic. We're able to penetrate tumors, and we can get good by distributions. And we did similarly mouse studies showing, again, that high-dose chemotherapy will kill, but the low dose of the nano device allowed the mice um, to live, but also treat tumors. Um, and I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to show you the last part, which just basically showed that these go into cells in different ways. But I will just mention that, um, sorry. I have to go back. That there are now many studies being done on nano devices and nanoparticles that are occurring. We're focusing more now on pancreatic cancer for the nano devices. This was the team in Vancouver that had done a, done a lot of the biology work. This is a larger team. And I wanted to just at the end go back to the beginning, which is the beginning of life here on Earth, right? At least to uh, scientists. And if you look at the beginning of life on Earth, you'll see that we had the primordial Earth. And in that primordial earth, we had the primordial goo or soup. Oops. I don't know if this just point. Oh, sorry. We have the primordial. Where's your pointer? We have the primordial soup, right? And if you hit that primordial soup with lightning bolt, we think you started forming the original molecules of life, and these molecules then began to assemble and make DNA and RNA and self-replicate, and that was really the beginning of all life. Right? It was this primordial soup of these small molecules. And some would say, well, we're going back a little bit in our evolutionary scheme. Um, but if you look inside of these cells that came out of this primordial soup, we saw all these little machines working. We see all these things building microtubules, breaking microtubules apart, ribosomes carrying out functions. Guess what the size of all these machines is? They're 1 to 100 nanometers in size. They're nano devices, nanoparticles, right? So biology had discovered nanoparticles a long time before we did. We're trying to replicate a lot of it. So I leave again, I'll leave with this slide. Ikawa mamua, kawa mahope, the future is in the past. I love this artist because this artist really captures what I feel is a, a lot of Hawaii, which is in, in Hawaii, your ancestors don't leave you. They're with you currently. <laughs> and I love this slide because you can see the tired the very tired um, person like us <laughs> in real life um, is being assisted by the ancestors, um, allowing them to go forward. All right, thank you. Any questions? Uh, yeah. Here are Dr. Gillette. Yep. This may not be a fair question to ask you, but I think, I hope it's timely. Yeah. Um, it's been suggested, certainly in a number of, of news reports, that um, immunizations may not be as long-lasting as actually getting the disease. And that has implications for things like polio, which, you know, most of us benefited from the vaccine. But, you know, we're now seeing booster shots for, well, the, uh, the chicken pox that I had when I was three years old. Yeah. What, is your, what are your thoughts on that whole issue? Well, I'm not an expert in that area, but, it, but that seems to be true. There, so many people, they were immunized 20, 30 years ago to things like polio and a lot of these other things. They seem to have a, a half-life where, where over time you may lose the same immunity that you had before. So there is a concept of re-vaccinating re some people. Most of us are healthcare workers, though. 
and, it, and, and so most of us end up being revaccinated <laughs> somewhere along the way. I know when I change from one university to another, I always like never have the right paperwork and they always say, oh, just redo the vaccine again. Um, but, but you're correct. So what's, what's turning out is that what most places will test now, if you go to a new hospital or you have to credential a new, most places will check your titers and see whether you're actually provoking an immune response. And if your titers aren't high enough, they'll re you'll need to go through the vaccination again. So that's correct. We, we kind of lose it over time, it looks like, for a lot of these things. Any other questions? Yeah, Jim? Oh, this will be a really hard one now. <laughs> possible differential radiation sensitivity um, with regulatory T-cells versus cytotoxic T-cells. Any update on that? Um, you're correct. There may be some more added benefit to T-reg, but we, I don't think we know, Jim, you might know better than me, we don't know how to regulate the regulatory T-cells. So I don't think we take advantage of that yet. I the regulators by, of the regulators yeah, I of the regulators? I wouldn't put it by Jim to have a really good idea there's an R01 grant for that, but we don't know how to regulate those yet. But um, our best regulators have been the things that take the brakes off the immune system right now. But I think I hope to show that that's the tip of an iceberg for what's coming forward. But th that was a big tip. That really tipped everything. That, that tipped the balance for us. And I would encourage us in radiation oncology to really look at how we can manipulate radiation. Medonc is in there, right? Medonc's like, we're gonna give this thing that totally blows the immune system apart, knocks it down. We're gonna give that rah, rah, and it's working, right? So why don't we give something that just spills antigen, doesn't really take the immune system down almost at all, yeah? Yeah. How do you begin to program the immune system so yeah. that you don't reject all your own tissues? Right. This is why I think most immunotherapy fails is because those clones of reactive T cells don't exist or they're so they've been deleted. There are multiple means of, of tolerance. Now, unless you've got sequestered antigens, such as the eye or the testis, where antigens don't appear until puberty, uh, a lot of this is doomed to fail. Now, the, the flip side is if you're immune suppressed and if you've got a transplant, you do see more cancers developing. So there are clearly mechanisms of immune surveillance, but it's far more complicated than just uh, take the brakes off and hope you're, you're going to kill a cancer cell without killing the whole person. That's where autoimmunity comes from. Right. So I, I would agree with that. It, it, is, it, it is much more complicated, but remember every T cell has, you know, the MHC the, or the HLA component to it. So it's already self-checking that part of the function is, is this self or not self. The trouble is most cancer is self, came from us. <laughs> Right? So uh, let's move on to the yeah. SAM, just so we don't uh, get late Sorry, for our yeah. other speaker. So I hope, uh, hope we all got this. Which of, which of the following cells are adaptive immunity? Not your innate stuff that's been sitting there, but the stuff that modifies and changes, right? One B cells, two T cells, right? Things that might adapt, right? Three macrophages sitting there, mast cells kind of sitting there. <laughs> Right, or both B and T cells, you know? So which ones are adaptive? <laughs> yeah, so B and T cells were those adaptive active cells sitting in that slide, so I hope. Did it show how many got that? I just wanted to say. Okay, I didn't do a good enough job there. <laughs> I'll try better <laughs> next time. All right, so um, molecules in, in, in um, putting the brakes, right, on the immune system, um, one, but now ones that we were able to take the brakes off with, right, with antibodies, right? Is it CTLA-4, right, PD-1? Right, both CTLA-4 and PD-1, or neither. I'm talking about totally other stuff when I'm talking about the breaks of the immune system. All right. 
right, close. That's better. <laughs> yeah, these are critical. These are the top molecules, the penilumab and the volumab. You'll be seeing a lot of trials coming out on these in almost every cancer, including radiation therapy together with a lot of these agents. So we're going to be hearing a lot of these agents. Um, nanoparticles are classically defined as being between 1 to 100 nanometers, sorry, in size, right? 1 to 100 meters in size, like a football field, right? Just a minuscule 1 to 10 nanometers in size, or 80 to 100 nanometers in size. All right, we're almost there. <laughs> they, are, they are one to 100 nanometers in size, right? None of the others ap apply and nothing bigger. Some things bigger were allowed in for a short while, but not more. Important investigations in nanomedicine include the um, use of nanotechnology. Number one is just in the detection of small concentrations of peptides, right? Or DNA or other small molecules. Number would be just that. Number two would be the ability to carry out chemical biological reactions with very, very small amounts of material, like your breath or other things. Number two is just that, only that. Number three is a combination with other biophysical therapies, like MRI, like ultrasound, like radiation to help with cancer killing. So number three would be just that with nanotechnology. Number four is observation of molecular machinery in real time, seeing things occur in the cell with these fluorescent dots over time. Number four would be just that. Or number five, which would be nano devices, nanomedicine can do all, can look at all of those things. <coughs> okay, good, we're almost there. <laughs> and then number five, um, polymer nano devices, that was the set of nano devices that I spent the whole last part of the talk on at Michigan and Roswell and, and then Van uh, on Vancouver, right? These polymer devices can deliver agents to tumors better, right? Um, meaning giving a, a focused delivery through angiogenic microvasculature, or through ligand to deliver the gene better. Um, can improve the delivery of chemotherapy better, right? Something like methotrexate and other things could be attached and delivered better to tumors. It can improve the therapeutic ratio of chemotherapy, meaning that you can get better delivery to tumors, but some sparing of normal cells as well when you deliver by a nano device versus just the agent itself. Is it just one of those, one, two, or three, or is it all of those things um, were shown? <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay. Ooh. You need this. <laughs> you never want to end up in the bathroom with one of these things on.
Why don't we go ahead and get started? If everybody can take their seats. All right, so during this presentation, it's, it's coined liver, liver radiation, um, liver SBRT, and I kind of tried to expand it, and I've broken it into really three different sections, as you'll see here. The first slide is a pretty cool article, if you have a chance to read it, by Steve Chamora. Um, it's just kind of more of a, like an, a thought-provoking piece where kind of digging more and more, I think where we're going with liver radiation is more about the biology of the disease and probably less and less about the technical aspects. But where we are today is a little bit more focusing on clinical factors in terms of how we select patients and then also in terms of the technical factors. And that's mainly where we are and what I'll be focusing on primarily. So I chose to break it up into three sections, one being HCC, and you can see that I'm gonna to touch on workup, treatment options, et cetera, um, and also talk about SBRT as a bridge to transplant, because, and again, thinking about things that come up commonly in tumor boards and trying to understand what are, is, is there data out there, are there data out there to help support some of the decisions and or, I would say, argue the case for radiation. Um, and then in addition to that is focusing then and shifting to more liver metastases and obviously I can give a talk on just that. Um, so I focused a little bit more on colorectal cancer. And then finally, I have a couple case reviews and talk a little bit about um, dose constraints that we use at MD Anderson um, and that some of that are out there in the literature. And, and I have a couple slides on some interesting things from Astro that were presented recently. So. Um, in terms of primary hepatobiliary cancers, fifth most common solid organ cancer worldwide, and it's still rising. And in 2019, it's expected to be 42,000 cases. So again, we talked about pancreas cancer at approaching about 60,000 cases. So this is quite not as common as pancreas, but it's becoming more and more of a, of a, of a challenging issue. Um, in well-selected patients, and well-selected patients are going to have early-stage cancers, not involving vessels, not having extra, meta, extra uh, hepatic disease, good performance status patients, good liver function. Generally, we're going to put them into the cancer paradigm. Those patients can do exquisitely well. They can have, you know, survivor, um, su um, survival in, in the 80s and 90 percent, um, but again, we need to select patients better. And then when it comes to metastases, it's similar in a sense that we need to pay attention to the biology of the tumor that we're dealing with. If it's, a, like we talked about with oligometastatic disease, if it's um, breast cancer, for example, it's generally gonna be a more favorable outcome. If it's pancreas cancer, uh, it's generally gonna be a little less beneficial. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but just as a quick review, um, these patients are not, it's not straightforward. These patients actually tend to look okay in early stages disease. A lot of these tumors are found incidentally due to other purposes, but in advanced stages, they start presenting with a lot of local obstructive symptoms, hepatic failure, and you can see here, it progresses uh, to a pretty, pretty difficult state for these patients. Um, you know, by a show of hands, um, how many, just to kind of make sure everybody's, you know, together with me here, how many of you understand and can describe sort of the different segments of the liver by a show of hand, like pretty comfortably? Okay, so that's good. That's exactly why we're doing this. So we're actually going to take a minute, and I want everybody, it sounds like I feel like I'm like in my, my kids, like giving my middle school thing, but, you know, it's like, I actually, be honest, I, I didn't really know this really well either, and I do GI. So I'm just saying, like, not, not up to this, but I'm just saying, the reason this is important is we need to be able to speak the same language as our surgeons, okay? And now our interventional radiologists in tumor board will say, well, you know, in segment eight, so if you don't know where segment eight is, you're kind of looking up at the scan <laughs> saying, where the heck is that? So this is a kind of a cool little thing, but if you take your hand, everybody take your hand like this and stuff your thumb under there, all right? Turn it and look at yourself like you're, like, looking at a puppet, right? And then think of your middle finger as being the one that you shouldn't stick up, and that's number one, okay? So the knuckle of the middle finger is number one, and then from there, you basically kind of go in a circle, and you go two, three, so you go in a circle. If you're looking at it, you go one, two, three, four, right? And as you come around, the lower part is five, six, seven, eight, and four, of course, is complicated. It's above the one, so 
It's not perfect, but again, one, right? And you go across underneath. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if you remember anything, it's that the lateral edge is, is going to be your six and seven. And your medial edge is going to be the two and three. And if you remember, the middle finger is being one in the central. And then the caudate is kind of your thumb that's tucked behind. So I just bring it up because as we're doing more and more, if we're radiating, and also as we do our prescriptions, and you're saying, okay, well, I previously radiated one in the left lobe, one in the right lobe, and one in the dome. It's going to be a lot better if our prescriptions moving forward say I radiated segment seven, seven segment two, posteriorly, et cetera. So as a field, I think this is going to be important for us to evolve. The other thing that's evolving is how we actually work up these patients. So this is kind of the standard workup. You're going to get a CBC. You're going to get AFP. You're going to get a bone scan to make sure they don't have metastatic disease to the, to the bones. Um, but what is changing is, is, you know, historically, if you had a tumor greater than a centimeter and it's in a cirrhotic patient and there's two classic enhancements on a three-phase CT or MRI, that there's a late arterial phase and a, and a portal. So basically, you get enhancement on the arterial phase and you get washout in the venous phase. Pretty easy, right? Well... Nothing is easy, um, and I think, you know, before I go to that in a second, is that in general, MR is better than CT um, for the most part, especially with HCC, so it's just an important thing to remember, and I think that it's come a long way, um, but I just want to bring this up. This is, how many people, show of hands, have you even heard of, of, of LIRADS, LIRADS criteria? Okay, a couple. Okay, that's good. So this is, you know, relatively new relatively complicated um, and you know I, I think the take home of this is just understanding that if you go across and I'm not going to go through this whole thing but I think it's just to kind of make sure that if you're not aware of it you now have a resource that you can look at but if you go down uh, raise your pointer if you go down maybe pen okay yeah so observation as you go down you're basically, the red is going to be where you're getting more and more towards HCC. So, if, for example, if there's not a mass, if there's no mass actually there, there's just enhancement, that's going to take you down a category that's more benign or that you need to watch it. On the other hand, if there's a mass, and for example, if there's tumor in that mass, or if the tumor, sorry, if the tumor is in the vein itself, that automatically kicks you over to a very high likelihood that there's HCC. So the reason I just want to bring this up is then this table, even though it's really small and hard to read, is that based on the LIORAD score, if it's a LR5, it's definitively HCC, and in that circumstance, you do not need a biopsy, okay? So just take a minute, stare at it a little bit. I had to do the same. Um, get rid of that. Um, so just, just again to be aware of it. And also Im important to mention, it's only applicable if they have a cirrhotic liver and they have current or prior HCC. Um, that thing's not going to go away, is it? That's okay. We could ignore it. Um, so the other thing, as I mentioned, just, you know, if you're not familiar with the different MR um, sequences that, that are at your, you can kill it for me. Thank you. Yeah. You learn so much. It's not there, is it? That's okay. That's all right. It adds a little bit of flavor. <laughs> um, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Just like coloring. I figured it out. All right. Um, just like contouring, right? Um, so, so MR is your friend. And also the other thing I want to talk about at MD Anderson, we use spec imaging a lot too. So, PET, SPECT, everything again at your disposal, especially in metastatic disease. Um, a lot of what we do centers around child, child pew score, okay? So you want to make sure that you understand this. And I think most of everybody does at this point. And in general, child pew A is going to be most of the patients that we're going to treat and take care of. However, early child pew B that are on the cusp with favorable features are also ones that we're typically going to treat. If you're treating a child pew C, it really should be palliative doses. It really should be to help with obstructive symptoms or pain, or maybe to try to relieve um, high bilirubins, et cetera, to try to get patient back on systemic therapy. 
I'll skip over this. Um, in terms of patterns of failure, um, you know, most, again, it's just really important. A lot of medical oncologists and surgeons don't realize that patients can die of local progression, okay? So we have a very big role in this, and I'm gonna go through some of the literature, but it's important to recognize that and explain that in general, TACE is not gonna offer a lot of tumor response, right? They're gonna have mainly consistently, it's gonna be stable, but with radiation, we can actually see response, we get response, and actually we can also relieve a lot of symptoms. And, and if we don't control the disease, and this is where the BED comes in, and patients then have subsequent obstructive symptoms and you cannot re-irradiate, that's where you're gonna run into trouble. The other thing, just a quick caveat is, as you probably know this, but bone metastases and other metastases are exquisitely sensitive to radiation in general, and I think it's underutilized in our field um, overall. So I think it's important to remind them that it's a good option also. So again, as mentioned, surgery by definition is a standard of care. And I'm not gonna get into too much detail, but if you remember the Milan criteria, right? So tumor of less than three centimeters or three centimeters combined, I always have to remember that part too, but, but the, the key is the Milan criteria in general is gonna be de determining whether or not they're a transplant candidate. If they're not a transplant candidate, the next thing is basically gonna be, can you do surgery, can you do it safely? And if you can't, as I'll get into a minute, you then start looking at these other categories of ablation with stereotactic radiation, cryoablation, RFA, or intraarterial therapies. And again, why do we even do intraarterial therapy? Intraarterial therapy is beneficial because most tumors gain oxygenated blood from the hepatic arterial system, right? And so if we can go in through the hepatic artery, we're gonna preferentially kill tumor and we're not gonna kill the normal liver parenchyma, okay? So it really, at the end of the day, is pretty focused by definition. Um, a couple things though, when we talk about chemoembolization, there are systemic side effects. Patients feel pretty crummy, they can feel sick. And actually I've had patients that have had surgery before that get abscesses, especially like if they had a Whipple. If they've had a Whipple and they get taste, they can actually get an abscess and they can die. I've had a couple patients die from it. So both um, TACE as well as even Y90. Y90, it is still a systemic therapy. It can still make people feel tired and fatigued, whereas in general, stereotactic body radiation therapy is well tolerated. So again, early stage resection liver transplant, stage three and four, you're gonna start looking at sort of things that treat larger regions and or systemic therapy. But really where we are right now is, again, multi-D clinics are important. This patient during their trajectory of care the therapies are gonna evolve. And I think what drives me crazy is that you have these patients in centers that are driven, and we've actually published on this. You might go to a center where the interventional radiologist is king or queen, and they're the ones that are actually driving what happens to patients. Others, it's the surgeon. Others, it's rad onc. Ultimately, where you wanna be is where everybody works together to say what's the best way to treat this patient in a comprehensive way. And I think this synergy here, this intersection of these different therapies is where we need to go. Um, I, I kind of looked through the literature, and this is a recent publication that just came out, um, and it's in, in a medical oncology journal. And I just wanted to look at wh how do they view our world, right? Because when we're sitting in tumor board, you have to think, what are they thinking? What is the surgeon thinking? And so if you look in this, it kind of makes sense that, again, BCLC or the Barcelona um, staging classification scale, again, is, is incorporating, and I forgot to put a slide in here on this, but it's incorporating um, extent of disease, performance status, child pew score, et cetera. So it's kind of encompassing all those factors into one score. And if they're a favorable score, again, transplant surgery, if they can't get transplant or can't get surgery, then it goes into local regional therapy. And then if they can't, they go into metastatic, you know, the metastatic paradigm. Um, this is, I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but this is a good reference. This is, this is a brand new hot off the press of the newer first line and second line therapies that medical oncology is considering. So it's not just serafinib anymore. There's a number of different therapies. And again, I think just getting aware of these so that when you're having that discussion as the medical oncologist, like, well, we're just gonna put them on, you know, uh, regorafinib. Uh, eh, um, what's the data on that? What's the response? Well, the response isn't that good. So, you know, and the toxicity is X, Y, Z, as you can see here, probably radiation might be a good next step for that patient. This is a really nice slide that Laura Dawson has been kind enough to share. Um, this is something that she's been showing for a long time, where radiation fits in. And again, I think if you kind of focus in the real 
early stage patient, child pew A or on the border of AB, those are the patients that we're typically going to treat. And when you get into the stage D or high stage, it's really just palliative radiation in general. But I think wherever there's a challenge, there's opportunity. And this is a really nice study, um, uh, uh, the article that actually outlined what are some of the barriers in terms of getting SBRT to where it needs to be in our field, and then what are some of the opportunities. And a quick example is that I looked in, I read through Wikipedia um, just to see what they actually say, and it's interesting, there's no mention of radiation. I'm serious, it's, it's, it's amazing to me. But there's everything from ablation to surgery to serafinib, no mention of radiation. So we still have a long way to go. So what are some of the key factors, again, for all of you who are in tumor board, what's a good kind of patient that we should be treating for SBRT? And here you can see, in general, low number of lesions, small tumors, where the distance from the organs at risk is as far as possible because we don't want to cause any bowel problems or stomach problems for those medial lesions, for example. Child PUA, and in general, more free liver volume. And again, free liver or functional liver is you, you contour the whole liver, separate out the GTV, and that's going to be your functional liver, right? But it's not as easy as that, and I'll get into that a little bit, but you know, especially if they've had other issues or surgeries or whatever else, sometimes that functional liver might not be exactly that, but, but for our purposes, that's typically what we follow. Um, the literature is evolving. There's a lot more for you to stand on, but um, it's still, you know, if you look at this, this is kind of a review article looking at the different dose and fractionation regimens. They're kind of all over the place. And part of that is because it's the same thing as the oligometastatic literature um, that in some cases it's, it's not clear that the patients are so different. So it's kind of hard. But the thing that's clear is the local control. These are radiosensitive tumors. The local control with a high enough BED is actually quite good and, you know, in at least the worst case, 70% range and best case, 90% range. And it's pretty consistent over the years. And so what does the literature tell us? This is some really great, I just talked to Ted yesterday, Ted Hong's data um, and JCO showing really promising survival rates with protons, um, both looking at HCC and ICC. Patients were selected out to have no extra hepatic disease, median size of five centimeters. But you could look again, the local control rate at two years is impressive. And the overall survival is also impressive compared to the historical literature. And also, what this study showed us is that we, you know, if we can get to, for especially bigger tumors, we need to get a BED. You, this is kind of a common theme at this conference. The higher the BED that you can give safely, the better the outcome. And again, you could see here that the patients that died, a lot of them still had liver failure as a primary component. So, um, in addition to that, this is just another, another study. This is an MD Anderson study. Uh, I think this is Sunil Krishnan's data uh, that just came out recently. And you could see again that a BED of 90 or greater also resulted in better outcome. And this was also all proton cases, et cetera, and mainly child PUA cases as we would expect. I was trying to dig around and say, well, what about little tumors? So smaller tumors, because a lot of the literature has been on these bigger tumors. So it's kind of a messy, it took me a while to stare at this and I was trying to fi figure it out, but just to make it easy, because the, the data is a little bit hard to follow, is that if you look at SBRT and early stage HCC, there was a systematic review done of, of all the literature, and the take home was tumors that are less than five centimeters, that have had no other, no other treatment, the local control and overall survival are actually similar to surgery with a low toxicity, and actually you don't need to have a super high dose. So, and, 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 as, and that's slightly different than with the larger tumors, you really need a higher BED. At least in their review, dose didn't seem to matter as much. There wasn't as strong of a trend. So it's just something to think about with these really small tumors, you may not need to go to as high of a dose. All right, so where are we today? So I was at NRG um, a couple weeks ago. Some of you may have been there. Laura Dawson, you know, has, I give her, she's an amazing person. She's obviously going to be our astro president, um, has worked so hard on getting this trial through the finish line with so many changes in practice patterns, et cetera. Um, it's still chugging along. It's not, it's not closed yet, but, um, and she's enrolled, I think about, I can't remember, 100 and some. So there, we'll get some data out of it. But 
I think to this point, if you're going to treat off a protocol, following this kind of approach is probably the right way with these dose constraints um, in general, although I'll talk about some more dose constraints. Another study, so again, this is just to kind of remind everybody, this is serafinib or serafinib and SBRT, right? Um, so this was a hard study because a lot of patients don't want serafinib. As we know, the trial look in metastatic setting was not overly impressive. There's a lot of toxicity with it. So it's been a challenging thing. And then also, most of these patients have to have vascular involvement. So a follow-up to this study based on this data that I'm going to show you, which is NRG1003, which is Ted Hong and Eugene uh, Coy at MD Anderson and obviously at Harvard, um, is this literature that the Princess Margaret Phase 1-2 study, which used six-fraction SBRT, showed a local control of about 87%, did show a worsening child pew. So worsening child pew is if you're at an A and you get radiation and you're now going down to a B or C, obviously that's going to put you at a greater risk of toxicity of, and of dying, right? So again, we want to give enough dose to kill the tumor, not enough dose to cause a worsening of cirrhosis or a worsening of liver function. The overall survival looked re reasonable. And then with the combination of MGH, MD Anderson, and UPenn using a 15 fraction regimen, um, you could see the local control was fairly similar. And that, and that it actually was a little bit better than stereotactic, which kind of makes sense. By spreading it over 15 days, the risk of liver toxicity or RLD or, or worsening of, of, of child pew is better. And the overall survival even looked a little bit better. So this is the current study. If you can open this at your institution, it really is a big help. It allows five or 15 fraction radiation and it's determined by the treating physician. And, and, and again, patients are stratified by vascular thrombus or not vascular thrombus. And this is a straight up, there's no serafinib. This is a straight up either protons, um, uh, protons or photons. And the way this works is if you don't have protons at your center, you just enroll in photons. If you have protons at your center, then you can obviously enroll in either one. So when we think about kind of bring it all together, what are the patients again that we would treat? Any patient, you know, without cirrhosis, ideally, child A preferable for RTOG112. And then, you know, if you're going to do child B, then actually I forgot to mention that. Um, the NRG also does allow some early stage child pew B. And then in, in general, patients that are treated are going to be non-surgical, non-RFA candidates, um, and classically about three centimeters. But these bigger tumors, again, um, are effective, but the dose needs to typically be higher. The next thing I wanted to bring up is, this is a, let me see, how many of you have ever treated with SBRT as a bridge to transplant at your institution? Got one, two, okay. You know, um, so when I was at um, Hopkins, we actually used SBRT quite often as a bridge to transplant. When I got to MD Anderson, the surgeon that works there had a couple bad experiences and so it was like barred, you know, no, ra <laughs> no radiation as a bridge to transplant. So this is a study um, that um, um, Dr. Kuchenko and myself and Eugene kind of helped pull together. It was, a, it was a national cancer database study, and it was a very simple question. It took patients that went to transplant that had no radiation or those that got preoperative radiation. And the reason I wanted to highlight this study is because it's one of the few that really shows some of the toxicities associated with this. And it's a little hard to read this, but you could see that there wasn't a lot that got radiation. 165 got radiation versus roughly 10,000 that did not get radiation. But the take home of this paper, and it's a little hard to see, I'll circle it here, although it might not go away again, is that the 90 day mortality or toxicity at the time of surgery was actually less with those patients that got radiation, despite the fact that the tumors were bigger and that the patient's characteristics were less, benefit, like less favorable. So the take home, and this is important to remember of this study, is that radiation did not add toxicity or mortality to transplant in the bridge setting, and the characteristics were worse with radiation, I'm sorry, worse without radiation as opposed to the other way around. So again, in a tumor board setting, if the patient isn't, has already failed taste a bunch of times, this supports that radiation should be safe. The next question is, what about RFA? How does stereotactic compare to RFA? And there's not a lot of data out there, but I think that this is a really nice study that you can quote. 
that shows that SBRT in general had a better um, uh, control rate than RFA, and it was significant. And you can see here, especially if a tumor was greater than two centimeters, that SBRT was better. So smaller tumors, RFA is beneficial for smaller tumors. Bigger tumors in general, SBRT is going to be more effective. The next question is, what about TACE? What about SBRT as an alternative to TACE? And this is another study out of University of Michigan. And you can see that in general, local control probability was superior significantly compared to TACE, and liver progression-free survival was also um, uh, superior with SBRT as opposed to TACE. So again, these are nice things to have in your toolbox when you're in your um, tumor boards. So in conclusion with HCC, it's important to, that came from another slide, but you know, the key is, I'll get to that at the end as far as simulation and such, but SBRT can treat HCC safely. Again, you want to pick the right patients that you're not going to hurt them, so small tumors, child PUA, uh, away from structures, usually at least two centimeters, away from the bowel and bladder, uh, bowel and, um, not bladder, bowel and, and stomach. It's been a long couple days. All right, and then SBRT should be considered for, again, out, early stage, 15 fraction regimen. I didn't do any 15 fraction regimen before I got to MD Anderson. I always did SBRT, five or 10 fraction uh, treatments. Um, but I have to say I'm a fan of the 15 fraction, especially with these big central tumors. And, I, and again, I actually like, the, if it's central, I think also protons does add some benefit and probably also from a radiobiology perspective. And finally, please, please try to open these trials at your center. That data is really important. And remember that it is an effective option, at least retrospective data, et cetera, um, as a bridge to transplant, but it needs to be evaluated prospectively. All right, switching gears to now liver metastases. So this is an area where I think we're, again, we're underutilized. There's, if, look at this, 135,000 new cases of cancer center in 2017, and almost all of these patients are, are essentially going to develop metastatic disease. We don't see enough of these patients, I don't think. I think these patients go on chemo for so long, we end up seeing them too far down the process, and I think trying to get in earlier it makes a big difference. And these are some important things, again, to share with your colleagues. Liver failure due to hepatic disease progression is the most common cause of death in patients with CRC. Liver is the most common site of distant metastatic disease, and liver metastasis significantly contributes to liver failure. So larger tumors replace liver parenchyma, affect blood supply, et cetera. And also keep in mind that if we can get to these patients sooner before it gets bigger, we also can treat more effectively. Um, and then these patients can stay on chemotherapy, but if they start getting, you know, elevated bilirubin and everything else because of obstruction, they're not going to be able to get any chemotherapy either. So it's a typical theme here in terms of how we approach these patients, but it's a little bit different, right? And the reason for it is mainly with HCC, you have cirrhosis. You have a liver that's already unhappy, right? With liver metastases, you have something else, which is called steatohepatitis hepatitis, or fatty liver, that can occur in patients who are heavily treated with chemotherapy. So it's not, it's not I mean, it, people always say, oh, you know, cirrhosis is horrible, but it's really, we could definitely push the limits on metastatic patients. You can, but keep in mind that if they've been heavily pretreated with chemotherapy, their liver function may not be as good as it seems that they may be. But again, some of the same caveats exist in terms of what are the local therapies we can use. Um, so the data that's out there, uh, as you could see here, this is some of the earlier data out of Colorado um, with Kyle Rustovan and, and uh, Brian um, and others. Um, and you could see that, you know, they, they looked at several tumors, uh, several patients with multiple tumors, and, and, and to kind of get right to the point, that they were one of the first to really show that in liver metastases that you can get really good local control and, and we're looking at five years out. So this was a big study, this was an important study for our field because with colorectal metastases, the standard of care today is still surgery. But surgery does not come without a cost or a price and if we can give ablative doses of radiation and keep patients controlled, it's going to be a better quality of life. It's going to be more cost effective, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of benefits for us doing that. Again, similarly, if you look across the board, there's fractionation regimens that are all over the place. In Italy, they're doing you know, 25 times 3. Um, I think at, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Jeff Meyer, who was at UT Southwestern, who's now at Hopkins, is doing 
think 35 to 40 and one. I mean, I think there's a lot of fractionation regimens. I tend to stick with more of the five to 10 fraction regimens and sometimes three if they're small and well lateralized. But you know, I think that as you can see, the local control rates are more in the 70%, not in the 90, 100%. So what we're learning is that there are certain caveats. And I think these next, this next slide goes into maybe some of these caveats, that if you look in the Colorado data, the local control was decent, but the doses were really small. As you start getting up to a higher BED, similar to, to the HCC data, you start seeing higher control rates as expected. And then I think Ted's done some really nice work saying how do we go beyond just imaging and clinical characteristics? And you could see here that tumors with both mutant KRAS and TP53 were particularly radio resistant with a one year local control rate of 20%, okay? So as we can characterize these patients better, we'll have a better sense of how high we need to push the dose. And again, this is another study that just came out recently with Sloan Kettering showing that BED matters and that we get, again, longer local control with metastases with better, higher BED. And then this is kind of more of the same. So I think you get the idea and the theme behind that. I'm gonna switch gears a minute. Um, how many of you have Y90 of some capacity at your institution? Okay, a lot of you. Now, how many of you actually help deliver it or monitor it to some capacity with a raise of hands? Okay, and how many of you actually deliver it? Like how many of you like run the program? Okay, so a couple, okay. So I actually, um, when I was at Hopkins, I worked with the group there, the IR group there. I was part of the program, I helped treat. I got to MD Anderson and it was hands off. So I was not involved, I have not been involved at all in three and a half years. Um, you know, it's just an interesting paradigm. And I think that the reason I bring this up is, and I was on a recent consortium team of multiple experts to try to come up with some standardization around Y90. So I, I think it's important. I have probably too many slides, but I have a couple slides on Y90 because you're, you're gonna see more and more patients or you're already, actually, let me do this. How many of you have seen a patient that has already had Y90 and you're being asked to treat with SBRT? A couple. How about, how many of you have had treated somebody with SBRT and now are being asked to treat with Y90. Not that many, okay. Well, I might not spend a lot of time on this then. I'll go quickly through some of these caveats, but I think the key here is that Y90 is evolving. Y90, historically, we treated the whole liver or half of the lobe of the liver with Y90. Y90 is either given, it can be given um, uh, intraarterial through the femoral artery or through the radial artery, goes in, and then you're, you're essentially delivering either beads or resin, so glass beads or resin beads. Glass beads are therosphere, serospheres are the resin beads, and you're gonna deliver them into the hepatic artery and then specifically into, historically it was kind of spreading them out to the whole liver, but what's becoming more and more common is very focused delivery of Y90 into a, like a smaller tumor, upwards of doses of even three, 400, or even 1,000 in some cases. So they're able to be even more selected than us in some cases, but the, the data is still somewhat limited, okay? But I just want you to be aware that it's not just SP, you know, they're not just treating these big tumors anymore. They're able to go in and snake up and get that one tumor in some cases and treat it effectively. Um, I kind of talked about this a little bit, but this is how it's given. Um, and I, I added this just for your knowledge, if you you're kind of wondering, what's the difference between therosphere and serospheres? So I included this overview for you. And again, the kind of the key thing to remember is therosphere, at least historically, and if anybody, if I'm wrong about this, please update me because I might be a little outdated. But therosphere, historically, glass beads has been mainly used for HCC, whereas serosphere has primarily are, been used for CRC or colorectal metastases, and I'll get into that in a second. One of the bigger studies that's been done on this is this Surflox study. Um, it's a prospective open label multi-center study that had patients with non-resectable liver only or liver dominant um, metastatic colorectal cancer. And then they were stratified based on different factors and then randomized one to one with getting up just chemotherapy versus chemotherapy NY90. And you know, it was a big shocker and it obviously didn't help the stock um, that this actually did not show any survival benefit, right? However, there's always a little bit of caveat, and um, actually one side's out of, but oh, you know what, I, I took it out, I forgot. Anyway, the one caveat though is that there was a really good response rate with the Y90. So I think it's important to stress that, again, depending on what you're trying to do or achieve, if it's really bulky disease that you're worried about, 
going to push on other, other vessels or other issues that, that, again, Y90 is probably a reasonable option to try to get downstaging or some response. And, you know, these are, I added these for those that aren't aware. These are some of the characteristics that you need to think about when you're giving Y90, just so you're aware. Um, I think Y90 is in its infancy in terms of dosimetry. The, the interventional radiologists are trying to get to where we are in our field in terms of understanding how to bill appropriately, <laughs> how to actually do dosimetry. And then, you know, as I'm going to go into a little bit here, whoops, um, is also, you know, using SPECT imaging or PET imaging to better understand. Because there's one thing about going ahead and injecting it and saying, yep, I hit that area, right? And you can do comb beam CT. You could do a lot of things at the time. You can do a lot of um, um, functional imaging, including, again, PET or SPECT imaging. But, but again, it's nebulous a little bit. And I think we're, we're trying to understand how to, and again, you're usually giving about 120 gray or more, but how do, you, how do you create a BED that you can then combine with if you're doing 50 and 5, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that we're in, in the infancy of it, but it's something that we need to be aware of and continue to evolve. And, and I think this is a, you know, the, the, the differences in doses are going to be different. We need to pull it all together. So in general, in order to actually kind of combine these therapies, you need to determine the residual liver reserve. You have to understand that you still need to maintain 700 cc's of liver to be able to give even Y90 in general. And then you have to really understand, and I won't get into details, but you have to understand some of the ratios of, of, of just, is the liver capable of taking on more dose? Um, there are some softwares out there that are looking at this, so MIM software, Varian. Um, so there's actually commercially available systems to help you look at Y90 dosing and also comparisons. None of them are great, to be honest, and again, I think there's an opportunity here for further development. So this is just a quick case I'm going to go through. This is actually a case where a patient already received SBRT, but now there's been some progression. So again, you would uh, typically going to outline, you, you simulate the patient, you're going to outline the previously rated SBRT uh, areas. You're going to then do kind of a, you know, a BED conversion of what's already been delivered. And then, in this case, you have a you know, progression you could see on PET imaging. You're going to try to retreat a little bit of an overlap in this region. So you're, whoops. Ah. So you're trying to, you can kind of see where the PET uptake is. You're trying to kind of retreat that region, but also still maintain enough normal liver volume to do it safely. And I got, uh, um, Andy Kennedy is an awesome resource for this. He's been doing this a long time, actually, when I was a medical student at Maryland in the early uh, uh, 19 something. Um, he was uh, doing this and he's continued to pioneer the field in the area. But then here, this is your cumulative dose that you're delivering and then, you know, your DVH. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, we still have a long way to go and those that have do done a lot of this, uh, please feel free to speak up at the end, but I just wanted to make sure that you're aware. The literature out there about toxicity is even more limited, but you could see that in this study here, that the higher the mean liver dose from the previous radiation are the patients that, as you would expect, had the, had the vast majority of toxicity. And then this study actually gives you a sense that looking at the V100, the V140, the combined liver dose, that, that those that had the higher liver dose in that range are the ones that had the higher grade three plus liver toxicity. So again, it's in its infancy, but I think it's something that we need to continue to learn about. Um, what about SPRT and RFA for colorectal cancer? So we talked about it for HCC. What's the literature out there for, for it in colorectal? And you can see the ERTC e -R -R study looked at RFA, and it did suggest that it improved um, um, PFS and OS, but lesions greater than three centimeters are more likely to fail. And then again, another large retrospective study out of Michigan showed that SPRT was superior for any, any tumor over the size of two centimeters. This is, uh, and then I kind of looked and saw what, what studies are out there now. This is a really cool study, the laser study, um, that is looking at patients that have liver-dominant metastatic colorectal cancer who are undergoing hepatic radioembolization, and the patients get radioembolization first, and then based on the response and based on the imaging characteristics, they go into a bucket of different therapies. So for example, if it's adequate tumor dosing, everything looks marvelous, you leave the patient alone. On the other hand, if there's certain lesions that look like they just didn't respond very well, you would boost those areas with SBRT. 
So I think this is where our field is going. This is how we need to approach this, and this is going to be a much better way to kind of, again, data-driven, evidence-based way of evaluating the, the next steps. Okay. So the thing that's cool about our field is we're getting more and more toys, and we're learning more and more about how we can deliver this treatment effectively. So as we know, IMRT allows us to do, I actually was at Michigan when I trained and we were doing 1.2 gray BID to 80 gray. These people, these poor people stayed in the hospital. They had these 10 centimeter tumors and, and you know, it's, we've come a long way. They were just sick. They had a hepatic arterial infusion um, catheters in them. And so it was kind of, it's just nice to see that our technology has improved. All the things that we've talked about, so I'm not going to go into all these, but respiratory management, spacers, fiducials, I'm going to go through a couple of these. I'll skip over that. So again, just like with pancreas, we tend to use a lot of fiducials. What we'll typically do is if it's a small tumor, we'll have IR go in and say, look, if it's small enough and you can do RFA and you can ablate it, go ahead and ablate it, but put a fiducial next to it because it's probably going to recur. And when it recurs, we'll just go ahead and treat it. Or if they get in there and they feel like they, don't, they can't get to it or they don't have to treat it really well, then they'll put a fiducial in and we'll treat. That's how we kind of partner together a little bit more. And, and so it, it creates a more of a, of a collaborative environment. Um, for those that have proton therapy, uh, carbon fiducials are a little bit better to use, low Z material and a little bit more reliable from a dose calculation perspective. And ideally, you want to put it outside the tumor, not in the tumor. And then this was brought up yesterday about spacers for pancreas. So these are some of the spacers, the meshes. Um, I, I mean, I think that these are great, but um, you're, it's still invasive. A lot of times the surgeon's going to have to go in, put the spacers in there. But when you do it, you could see that in this case, there's huge dosimetric benefits. You could see a huge amount of sparing and separation from the stomach in this one case right here in the middle. Um, and as mentioned yesterday with the pancreas, kind of the similar approach, we, we approach them very similarly with immobilization, motion management, and I think whether you have ABC or you have the ability to do gating or breath hold, I think they're all the same. I think the one thing that is really important and it's similar in pancreas now, but is this idea of using the planning risk volume or PRV. And, and again, this is going to be important, especially when you have a medial tumor that's up against the stomach. You're going to want to make sure that you contour out the stomach, the bowel, any other luminal structures. And generally, we use about a five millimeter expansion on the OAR. And then we're going to, we're going to subtract that from the PTV to be able to give our, highest, our higher dose region. But the thing is with liver is a lot of times, because especially if you have a luminal structure nearby, you might not be able to get to a high dose. You might not be able to get to a BED, like let's say 67.5 and 15 fractions. So we sometimes just do the best we can. We'll, we'll, we'll essentially try to treat the core of the tumor, the true GTP, and push that to 65 or 75 gray if we can. And then we want to cover at least sort of the, the tumor plus 0.5 or a centimeter to at least kind of a microscopic dose of 37, 50, and 15. Um, I'll skip to that. And, you know, again, we're lucky to have CT on rails, but most people don't. So MR guidance or at least having comb beam CT with fiducials is very helpful. If you don't have fiducials and they've gotten taste, you could use lapidol. This is something that um, Laura Dawson has discussed for a long time. And, you know, you can track the, the thiodol, um, thiodol and you can also, or lapidol, and you can also just, if you really don't have much at your institution, you can really use the liver edge, although... Um, with fluoro, it's not great, but again, it's, it's, it works. Um, so here's a quick example. This is a two and a half year post RFA. Uh, the recurrence was seen and, um, the patient had a tumor thrombus involving the right main portal vein. And you can see the arterial enhancement. You can see the washout. So this patient was treated on RTOG 1112 and randomized SBRT followed by serafinib. We did an exhale breath hold um, VMAT single arc therapy for this patient. Again, it was a GTV plus a five millimeter expansion of the PTV, gave 40 gray and five, and the mean liver dose. Um, so again, functional liver is, is mean liver dose is the, the total volume of the liver minus a GTV. And you can see this is a 15 fraction uh, plan to 6750. I won't go through this in detail, but these we have actually at MD Anderson because we have so many patients, <laughs> so we treat about 600 patients a day. Um, we have these dose constraints for each of our disease sites. And so these are really helpful. 
Um, so I included in, in the talk a 6750 uh, dose uh, sort of uh, constraints in 15 fractions with some data to, to support it. And also just an example DVH. And then for more of like a set, like more of a colorectal cancer, like where you're giving in this case, we chose to do 70 and 10 fractions. Um, again, just kind of combining and showing you. And you know, the best thing to think about is usually your luminal structures and making sure that your liver minus GTV, we're gonna be a little bit more conservative in HCC and you could be a little less conservative in, in the colorectal um, example. So in the last couple slides, just talk a little bit about toxicity. And you know, I think that it's evolving. So we have the Amami criteria. Um, and and you know, I, I think it's, it's a really interesting area for research. And I think we're learning more and more. If you look at just trying to understand the biology of the architecture and the things that we're learning compared to other disease sites. And what we're learning is that really the sinusoids and the endothelial cells are, seem to be the most sensitive to radiation injury. And, and that by definition, it's certain components that obviously can lead to breakdown that can then lead to radiation-induced liver disease. And I think, let me just jump to, so the literature out there is evolving. This is some of the classic literature that Laura Dawson has done. And I think I was actually, I trained at Michigan, but I still find the Lyman and TCP kind of complicated. I think it's just not easy for all of us to use. I think it's great data to support and show us what the mean liver dose is. And I think it gave us some early data to support what the, the true dose constraints are. Um, so I think this gives you like a very basic understanding of for primary liver cancer, a mean liver dose in general of 28 gray is gonna be very safe in a two gray fraction and for metastatic 32. But I, I think, again, there's so many factors including tumor size and such that goes into this. And then, you know, the one that we typically use is 700 cc's less than 15 gray in three fractions. And then I, I showed you the MD Anderson criteria that we typically use. Um, I think at the end of the day, you just want to be a little bit conservative in disease sites that you know that the, that the dose response is going to be solid. But in metastatic colorectal, for example, where especially if there's genomic features that are un, unfavorable, you want to go higher. Um, and again, I think I just provided you with a couple slides of some of the other data that's out there to suggest some of the sort of the cutoffs um, of what, you know, kind of are evolving as we go forward. This is some of the, again, some of the more classic um, mean liver doses um, that were published a bit ago. Um, in terms of just a couple slides on Y90, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it, it, you know, you're giving a large dose and these patients also can have risk of ulceration radiation pneumonitis because you can have shunting to the lung. And, I, and also, I just want to stress that these patients do have systemic symptoms. They feel pretty crappy afterwards. Not to say we don't cause symptoms, but you could see that they actually have a lot of abdominal pain. They can have vomiting, and, and they, they have systemic effects. And, um, you know, the other thing is that this is a really nice trial, a nice summary that we published recently that kind of goes through it. And again, I just wanted to provide you with some literature that you can go to to sort of encompasses some of the recent studies and some of the toxicities. But the take home is generally in the new SBRT data with good technology and where we're selecting the right patients, the grade three, four toxicity in general is pretty low. And then this is kind of a, uh, Eugene Coy does a lot of really cool imaging work at our, at our institute, at, at MD Anderson, our institution. And um, one study that he's doing right now is he's doing SPECT imaging on all patients that have had previous radiation or surgery. So for example, historically, if patients only have, you know, 700 cc's of functional liver, you start getting nervous about how much you can give. So he's doing a prospective study with two cohorts, one with advanced cirrhosis and then one with prior liver resection or other chemotherapies or even radiation. And he's doing SPECT imaging and using that to say how much dead liver or non-functional liver is there compared to functional liver. And it's giving him a better understanding of, of you know, what, what can I safely deliver. In addition to this, this is just a paper that came out not too long ago out of Michigan using IC Green, which is uh, uh, another sort of, again, another imaging modality. Um, and what they did is kind of cool. They would actually give a couple fractions of radiation, do the imaging, let the patient go home for a month, and then based on how the patient did, based on the repeat of the IGC reassessment, they would either stop treatment or they would then go ahead and radiate the patient. And by selecting patients on this imaging modality, they were able to really 
uh, they had a great local control at two years of 95%, and only 7% had a decline in her child abuse status. So I think, again, if we have better imaging to understand how risky can we be or should we be, so SPECT and then this, this technology or this imaging modality, I think, are nice things that we could use moving forward. Um, it's actually, oh, sorry, yeah, those are the curves just showing the same thing. All right, um, in the last couple minutes, so what's, what, what's out there now? And, and again, I have no relationships at all with, with reflection, um, but I just think that there's newer ways. So if we're going to treat multiple liver metastases, it is going to be nice that just like in the brain, you know, now we're treating 10 or 20 metastases, right, in, in, the, in CNS. Can we get to a point where in the liver I can treat 15 liver metastases in one setting? So whether we actually can get there or not, I don't know, but you know, reflection is looking at, it's kind of, I call it, it looks almost like Tomo on steroids. It's kind of like you know, rapidly, this thing spins around really fast. And by definition, you should be able to see the pet avid disease and then quickly radiate it. But again, it still needs to be proven, but it's something kind of exciting. And, and I think it'll expand our ability to deliver more radiation for, for liver. Um, and then this was just something that was kind of cool at Astro uh, this year. Um, one thing that comes up a lot is, okay, I have a patient that's on immunotherapy. Should we do the SBRT before? Should we do it after? We're thinking about giving immunotherapy. It's a very small study, and, you know, Cliff talked about this a little bit. I, I don't think we really know what's the right way, but this is a small study, but thought-provoking in that they looked at patients that were retrospectively, retrospectively identified that had both NEVO and radiation, and what they found is that if they looked at upfront, defined as prior to NEVO, or salvage, which is after four weeks of NEVO, that they looked at sort of how well did those patients do. And the take home was that if the patients got radiation upfront, they had a much better response and actually a better overall survival than those that did not. So I guess, again, if you're gonna give it, Ideally, it might make sense to go ahead and treat the patient and then put them on nivolumab, but again, we need more data to really understand, you know, what's the best way to do this. In summary, um, I, I just wanted to give you the RTOG liver protocol link. I think this is uh, important for us to, again, support. And then there's a really nice atlas if you're going to do contouring for, for the liver that I also included here as a reference. And with that, I just want to thank this, again, support from many people in terms of slides and support in pulling this together, and I thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Kind Any of on questions? Time. Thanks for the interesting talk. Um, so my question was sort of about treatment of metachronous lesion, lesions and like, you know, cumulative liver dose. So um, with either HCC or, you know, metastases, sometimes, you know, we'll treat a small lesion, six months later another one pops up. Um, if you look at like the 11-12 protocol, they have the, you know, constraints about mean liver dose, which you can run into really quickly. Um, so do you, you know, just do the 700 cc cutoff, or do you think some, you know, liver dose could be forgiven over time because of, you know, liver could regenerate, or are there s is there a specific point where you, you know, draw the line and say we can't do any more treatment? Really good questions, and I will say that I don't think there's a right answer, um, but it's a really good question. The way that we've approached it is we've been using a lot of SPECT imaging, and it's not that expensive. We usually don't have a problem getting insurance to help us. Um, and that's given us a lot of information as to, you know, you can look at those symmetry as we talked about of like we know what roughly was, what, what was planned to be delivered, but we don't know what that actual effect on the liver really was, right? So getting SPECT imaging, we can actually say, hmm, you know, not only did we, the GTV was this, but it turns out there's another 300 cc's that we cooked and therefore that's non-functional. And then that gives us a more accurate number of what we think we can actually deliver. And I think, you know, Dr. Coy, Eugene, deserves a lot of credit for this in terms of thinking through this. And so um, having that protocol open is really great in tumor board because we just say, well, we don't know. Let us get the SPECT imaging. Let's see what we have to work with. And so um, I think it's evolving. Um, but I also would say that this is so important where you take in, like as we've discussed a lot at this meeting, is putting everything together. What is the disease-free interval, right? So was it two months before those other lesions popped up? 
In that case, is it worth, if they've already had a lot of radiation, I would say, eh, let's just give it a little bit more time because I don't know if they're gonna develop three more lesions and then I've just put that patient through something. So I think time is a good thing in a lot of cases um, and see you know, what the likelihood of further progression is. And then also the, kind of the other things is what extra, is there any extra hepatic disease if there isn't? Is, are there other trial options for the patient? So I kind of look at it as re-irradiation, especially when you're trying to spare liver down the road or even for younger patients. I, I would say, okay, what else can we give first? Can we ablate that one for now? and leave that alone. So working with your team to really put that together and then kind of using radiation as a last resort and then using SPECT. And I'm hoping the IC green stuff could become more widely used because it looks pretty powerful in terms of helping us really understand what we can deliver. Joe, in regards to the pre-op before liver transplant, I think I heard you sa say that there were Less side effects, or there were, uh, was it less side effects? Less, less mortality. Less mortality, uh, despite them having worse characteristics. Correct. Okay, I just wanted yeah. to make sure I yeah. heard that right. And I'll make sure I'm clear on that question too when we have it up here. <laughs> so less toxicity, but no difference in survival, and they had, they had larger tumors and worse characteristics. So it's kind of powerful in that way, because a lot of times the surgeons are gonna be like, oh, you know, so I think it's, it's a nice option for us to have. Surgeons depend very greatly um, on liver regeneration and, you know, um, embolization and stuff. What, is there any data on regeneration of liver function after either whole liver radiation, partial liver radiation, or SBRT? Well, I'll give it my sense, but I've definitely, you know, for others that might have this, um, I didn't, uh, pardon me, I was a little more conservative in my, before my MD Anderson days in terms of like the doses that we went to. Um, I would say that Chris Crane pushed the limits a bit up to like 100 gray in multiple occasions. And in those cases, although anecdotal, it, it appears that there was some regeneration that occurred. Um, but I'll be honest, in the literature, I don't know if anybody else does. But, but I, I think that in the same way that, you know, when you do the portal vein embolization that you could potentially get the subsequential hypertrophy it looks like we're seeing some of that once you get to a high enough dose. But to be honest, I, I don't know about literature or, or any data that's really proven that. Anybody else aware of anything? Cliff, you know? No? Okay. Okay, so we'll go on to the SAM, and um, Ron wanted me to remind everyone here in the HOP setting, SBRT is still direct supervision. And also, remember all radiology exams, they still are under direct supervision. So um, in the HOP setting, even though there's the change in the rule. Okay, SAM. And by definition, we should be, right? I think that's the way I look at it. You know, if there's, it's, it's really like surgery. So in a, by definition, you should be present and or available at a minimum. So, all right, let's do it. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna, <laughs> all right. Now also, we won't start, I'll start the clock so everybody has some time. I'll make sure everybody understands. So a primary liver GTV measures 300 cc's and the whole liver is 120 cc's. What volume should be used to evaluate the liver constraint? So again, you want to understand roughly what is the functional liver, right? <laughs> so functional liver is going to be your total liver, and then you're going to be removing anything that isn't normal within that setting. So we'll go ahead and start the clock if everybody's okay with that. So the answer is either 600, 900, 1,000 or 1,600 math class. Yes. <laughs> I'm so proud. Okay. <laughs> All right. Next kind of math question. A planning organ at risk accounts for a potential overlap of which, so don't start until I go through this a little bit. Okay, a potential overlap of which of the following volumes, okay? So, um, basically, what we're trying to establish here is you have your, your OAR, and as we talked about, you're gonna expand your AR, OAR by about five millimeters, and then you're gonna take your GTV, and you're gonna expand that by five millimeters to one centimeter, we typically don't utilize a CTV that often in this setting, 
So you really want to understand, you know, what are the, what are the following vo volumes that you're really dealing with when we're talking about a PRV? So number one would be a CTV <coughs> and PTV, or number two would be that, you know, if you're looking at a planning organ at risk, you're looking at the OAR and that PTV that you're trying to cover, or GTV and PTV, or CTV and OAR. I hope I didn't confuse people on this one. It is a little bit confusing without a picture. I probably should have put a picture in there, but anyway. All right, we'll start. All right, okay. All right. This one's a little bit controversial, so we're going to take a little bit of time, <laughs> okay? Um, this is one of those I just want you to think through a little bit, all right? So a 67-year-old male, oh, don't start yet. Okay. Oh, uh, bummer. All right, so this is one where there could be multiple answers, so please pay attention to what I'm saying, <laughs> okay? A 60, and we won't start the clock until I tell you, so don't panic, all right? 67-year-old male with Hep B, child pew A, presents with a four-centimeter lateralized tumor, Lyorads 5. The patient is not a surgical candidate and wants to minimize any systemic side effects, okay? So in other words, the patient wants to be able to get done what they get done and not feel bad, be really tired, and also it turns out that the interventional radiologist just left and went to the competition. <laughs> so options include one, RFA, two, TACE, Three, Y90, or four, SBRT. Okay, we can start. Uh-oh. Is it because we? No. No. Just like our field, this has become more technologically challenging. <laughs> you need to be present for the SAM questions or you do not get credit, right? Is that the, also the way it works? <laughs> All right. Um, so again, just to remind everybody, um, what's the best, what's the optimal management for this patient who wants no systemic therapy, no systemic side effects, ideally? Okay. Ready? Go. and the IR guy is gone. <laughs> okay. Don't call it a comeback. All right, <laughs> next. All right, now, again, we won't start the clock until everybody's ready. <laughs> Which of the following HCC patients would be most suitable, AKA, safest for a patient with, uh, for liver SBRT. So which of these, based on everything we've discussed, is gonna be kind of the safest, when you take all those factors in together, which ones are the most important? So child pew A, so those are all those favorable features, and then you have a normal liver of, of 800 cc's, you know, it's a three centimeter tumor, but you have a big space between that and bowel. Child, P, child B, normal liver looks a little bit bigger, a little smaller tumor, but wow, it's pretty close to that bowel, right? So that could be kind of risky. Child C is 
somewhat scary, normal liver, it looks good. Um, you know, it's a tiny tumor, and you have a decent amount from bowel, but, um, you know, he's got a lot of other stuff going on. And then D is really bad, no normal liver, et cetera. So, you know, you put all that together, which, which option looks most favorable for a patient for SBRT? All right. Hey, I'll take it. <laughs> All right. And last but, oh wait, no. Yeah, last but not least. Okay. Relevant to Dr. Peng. <laughs> so this is the last one. Based on the NCDB database of Hassan et al., SBRT as a bridge to transplant, wi don't start yet, which of the following is a true statement? Okay. So remember, this is where we had the no radiation group and the radiation group. And at MD Anderson, the surgeon says, radiation causes lots of bad things. I don't want radiation at all before transplant. So which of these is true? Preoperative RT for HCC did not increase perioperative mortality or length of stay compared to liver transplant without RT. The patients with radiation um, who received RT had smaller tumors. So usually when we treat, they always have smaller tumors, right? So. Three, patients who received RT had a shorter time to transplant than those who did not. Um, and, you know, I think it, it just to be expected when we do what we do, it takes a little while for that plan to get done. And then overall survival was significantly improved that those who got radiation did awesome compared to those that did not get radiation. Okay, so we could start. All right, we'll take it. All right, thank you everybody. And so we have a 15, well it's a little bit, uh, we have a 10 minute break until 10.30 because I'm sure everybody would like to get out earlier rather than have a longer break, so 10.30.
St. Louis. <laughs> Okay. Good. Okay. So this is my uh, fourth and final talk. Uh, thanks again for inviting me here. Um, when I was coming up with uh, ideas and we were we were riffing on on topics, uh, clearly, clearly I must have hated myself at the time when I thought of trying to come up with this one. This is a form of kind of academic self-flagellation to try and put a talk together like this. Um, but I, I think it's increasingly important as we're, as we're using SBRT more and more to treat patients um, with, with a, a early stage non-small cell lung cancer because uh, sadly uh, it's still lung cancer and they still fail. And so I want to talk through the limited data and more just kind of conceptualizing how to think about managing these patients. Uh, so again, my disclosures, and then again, the other disclosures about slide sharing. We have a, a really, a really great, smart resident, Eric Brooks at um, Anderson, uh, who I liberally borrowed some slides from. So why don't we just kind of start with a with an example patient, um, somebody who has a, a borderline uh, inoperable or medically inoperable early stage lung cancer. Um, in this case, they they got 50 gray in five fractions and a two arc VMAT plan. Um, and you're going to follow that patient now. So before we even talk about failures, let's just kind of think a little bit through about the, the, the ways we think about following these patients. So the, the first thing we often do is we go to the NCCN, and the NCCN is, is, is kind of broad scope. It tries to be helpful, but it often gives us really large, um, uh, 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 kind of broad scope uh, definitions of things. And what they recommend doing after uh, some sort of local therapy uh, in a def completion of definitive therapy, which could be surgery or um, radiation, was getting a history and physical and a CT chest every three to six months for three years, and then every six months for two years, and then a low-dose, <coughs> non-contrast annual CT, um, which is based primarily off of the evolving CT screening data. Uh, and in fact, actually, you guys may or may not have seen actually the Nelson trial uh, was just published in New England Journal. That's a CT screening paper. I think it was yesterday or today. Um, but, you know, uh, what about some other guidelines? So that, that gives you pretty wide berth in terms of what you can do. You know, you could, you could pick the, the lower end of that and get a CT scan every three months for three years, or you could do the upper end and really just get many fewer CT scans. Um, there is also recently reported ASCO guidelines and these are primarily, there's kind of m uh, modest radiation oncology uh, input into the statement, um, and that goes right for the long interval. So it says CT chest every six months. And I actually think Tim Cruiser uh, put it best, uh, this was posted on Twitter, uh, and he said, raise your hand if you want to wait six months after SBRT for the first time to image. <laughs> so I think it's a practical point, right? I don't know a single patient that would be excited about waiting half a year uh, to get their first imaging. That might be, you know, we, we can get into a philosophical discussion and a, and a, and a large scale discussion about the, the, the benefit of some of the surveillance imaging we do. But I do think they make some, um, some promising and important statements and that is that PET-CT should not be used for surveillance. We'll talk a little bit about the data behind that in a minute. Um, certainly routine brain MRI should not be used for early stage lung cancer. Um, age should not preclude it. So if you're gonna offer it, offer it to people irrespective of age, um, uh, don't have a nihilism just because they're older. Um, and people are getting very excited about CT DNA. Circulating tumor DNA is certainly something which is being used more commonly. Um, may end up becoming a really neat way to watch as a, as a blood-based biomarker to see these levels decrease and then determine which patients may fail, but as of today is not um, a biomarker. So uh, the other and I think final kind of uh, follow-up consensus document. This was a Delphi consensus statement um, that was published recently and again kind of speaks to the uh, variability CT the chest at three months, six months, and 12 months at year one and then six months in year two and then annually at year three to five. Again though relegating PET CT as something that should be done for suspicion of recurrence. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how resist criteria is kind of inadequate for SBRT. Um, so if I was to 
state, perhaps in question form, <laughs> what a reasonable interval would be um, after SBRT for CT chest, I'd say anywhere from three to six months uh, is reasonable. But why, don't do, why not routine PET-CT? Um, so there's actually a couple studies that have looked at this, but this is one of the earlier ones, which I think did it nicely, and I, I promise I wasn't, uh, again, just putting, putting these studies on the slides because you're sitting in the audience here. But um, this was a, a, a nice, clean study, limited number of patients, but they did serial PET scans after SBRT uh, for early stage lung cancer. Um, and uh, in this study, um, uh, basically showed that, you know, of the, of the six of 13 patients that had an SUV max of greater than three and a half, so they still had what we would consider to be, you know, tumor scary levels of an SUV post-SBRT, uh, they were all disease free. There was no recurrence in those patients. So they're really, and, and this, has been, this has been repeated in multiple studies and we've, we've written similar uh, studies as well. Uh, Post-SBRT, routine PET surveillance causes more anxiety than it's worth. You're gonna see a lot of changes in the tumor. You could argue you may pick up regional and distant failure a little bit earlier, but the question is whether it changes the ultimate management of that patient. Um, and then actually my favorite one, uh, not to beat this to death, but I, I, I have to. <laughs> Uh, if you have a minimally invasive adenocarcinoma that you treat with SBRT, the SUV on those tumors is often like blood pool. You will have more SUV uptake after radiation than the tumor did before radiation. So that's not meaningful information either. So of course when you're following these patients, this is what all of our scans look like, right? Post-SBRT, you have a lesion right here and then it gets smaller and then it goes away. I don't know about you, but that's what 100% of my scans look like. <laughs> now, this is what our scans look like. So uh, lesion, and then you get some fibrosis, and then you tell the patient, don't worry about it, and then you watch it, and then it looks the same at, at 30 months as it does at 42 months, and then in retrospect you say, see, I told you so. Everything's okay. Um, and, and this is fine, um, but it is important to, to kind of have some features to look out for on CT scan to figure out what to use to trigger a pet. So I think triggered pets are fine, just not serial pets. Um, this is a nice study published uh, a few years ago um, that looked at the uh, so-called scanxiety. This is a, a, a term that patients often use, which is coming into the clinic with that anxiety that, that heaps up as you get your scan. Um, but you know, here's an example of a patient that doesn't have recurrence. So they have a lesion that's treated, he has some post-radiotherapy changes, a little bit of uh, scarring and fibrosis, but it really stays stable, perhaps a little bit softer over time. Um, in contrast, here's a patient with recurrence. So the lesion is here, you get the surrounding post-radiation treatment changes, you start to get a little bit of this, what you think might just be scarring, but then actually uh, it continues to evolve and it gets worse. And so when you start to see a delay in imaging changes where everything seems to be stable and then suddenly it's not, that is a lot worse than, than continuous evolution of changes. Um, and so this is what I was speaking about yesterday, someone had asked me about this, but sequential enlargement on scans is bad, enlargement after a year just spontaneously changing. I, I don't think I could claim that a patient's spontaneously developing new fibrosis after they've had you know, stable imaging features for a year to year and a half the so-called bulging margin, so where you have a scar and then you start to see some bulge around it, these rounded edges is also very concerning as well. And I think this would be, this is where you would want to consider triggering a pet. Um, so, you know, let's talk about the patterns of failure for SPRT. So when I'm up here debating a surgeon, I focus our entire argument around primary tumor control. Um, and that's what we've historically done. And we end up arguing over who has 95% control rates versus 97 versus 93. And it's, it's kind of a silly argument because at the end of the day, primary tumor failure does happen, but it's lung cancer. They develop regional and they develop distant failure. Um, now we should first think about what predicts for local failure because it does happen and there's some ways we should salvage it. But I think it's a humble reminder that you know, this is still a, a, an illness which um, ultimately pa patients fail systemically. But if we start with local failure and we look at predictors, um, clearly size is the dominant uh, feature, but this is really interesting data that came out of the Cleveland Clinic and now has been um, shown in multiple other institutions. 
somewhat surprisingly perhaps, although I think maybe if there were some biologists in the audience, they'd explain to us that you know, just looking at histology alone is really insufficient. But time and again now, we're starting to see that squamous cell carcinoma has higher rates of local failure than adenocarcinoma. Um, despite the fact that we have other disease sites where you might say that it's relatively radiosensitive. So perhaps there's something about the high hypofractionation, perhaps there's something unique about lung squamous cell carcinoma um, versus other disease sites. That certainly seems very likely. Um, but they even kind of posit in this paper that you might consider even having a higher BED for squames. Um, we haven't started doing that at our institution, but um, clearly, uh, and we, we, we've also seen this in our own data, that the squames seem to have higher rates of local failure. Um, that would be a reasonable question as well. <laughs> okay, um, but size still matters, and it matters as it relates to the local failure, but I think importantly, regional and distant failure. So this was a, a database analysis that we just did recently to support a trial we're developing where we looked at about 800 of the patients that we had treated with early stage lung cancer and stratified them by less than two, two to three, or three to seven uh, centimeters. And what you start to see is that as you get out over time, the curves start to separate out about a half a year. And uh, the larger the tumor is, you start to really see a jump in the rates of regional and distant failure. Um, and that's something that has uh, kind of been seen across institutions. So uh, uh, just because you start to see the patients doing well at a half a year, um, you know, this is when you can start to really see this jump. So you do need to follow these patients, and the failures, failures continue, by the way. So that's the other thing, too, is that um, uh, our failures can be quite late. I think, it, I think of this notion of we've gotten like 99% of the cells, and then it just takes a little bit of time for some of those to, to recur and then get us and then bite us um, in, the, in, the, in the butt. Um, this can come back here, and you can start to see it all the way out to a couple years, and then it seems to level off. So in terms of actual data to guide management of the different forms of failure, local failure, regional failure, distant failure, combinations of both, the data is rather thin. Um, so I want to just use, I think, this really nice paper that looked at the MD Anderson experience, but use it as a trigger point to just talk about these different um, uh, types of failures. Um, so in this case, this actually started out as a uh, 900 patient analysis where they were treated with early stage lung cancer and about a third of them recurred in some form or another and then they described their patterns of failure and management. Um, so I think just to kind of belie the point about the fact that there are a lot of different ways to skin a cat, even in this study looking at local recurrence and regional recurrence, there was a whole mixed bag of repeat SPRT, surgery, thermal ablation, conventional radiation, chemoradiation, brachytherapy, and chemotherapy. And I think that speaks to the variability of how all of us would manage these things in real life. It's complicated and there's no, no standard approach. But the question is, does it matter? I think we need to first begin with that. Does it, does, is, there, is there value in trying to salvage these patients with additional local therapy? Or is the cat out of the bag and there's no benefit? At least this data and a couple other papers would seem to suggest that there is value in salvaging these patients. So um, in this study, the uh, patients who had additional local regional control, so additional local regional therapy, um, their survival was substantially improved compared to the no salvage. It is a retrospective study, so there's inherent bias in terms of patient selection. <coughs> but even, con even for controlling for some of those key risk factors, there still remain remained an advantage. So I think uh, certainly with the tools that we have, and we'll talk more about this as we go through the individual features, my first statement would be that we shouldn't just have a nihilism. If they fail, that doesn't mean that they're done for. I think that there's still opportunities to help them. This is a uh, flow chart, again, that was in, uh, uh, not this paper, I think, but another, oh yeah, it was this paper. Um, and uh, uh, I think we can take this with kind of a grain of salt in terms of the preference and the order, but uh, certainly, you know, if you have isolated local regional or local recurrence, the question would be, could you re-irradiate? I think could is a soft question. Um, surgery is also something uh, that we should talk about as well, and we will uh, in a moment, because sometimes patients weren't good candidates beforehand, but when the scales tip and the risk-reward ratio starts to change, then suddenly people who are borderline, it might be reasonable to consider. I don't know how many of you guys uh, have access to people who do percutaneous radiofrequency ablation, um, but certainly this is, also an this is also a potential tool as well. 
Um, and I think uh, the last option for these patients should ultimately be systemic therapy alone. So what about local recurrence? Um, have people actually gone ahead and done something crazy like repeat SBRT after SBRT? And the answer is yes, multiple times. So there's now uh, a good handful of papers where people have done repeat SBRT. Um, one could question if it didn't work the first time, why do it the second time? Um, it could just be a stochastic issue. You could just not have gotten all the cells the first time. It seems reasonable to consider. Um, from a core principle standpoint, obviously the idea would be that you want to confine those doses to the area you've already injured. So in theory, if that lung is already injured, you can't make it more deader. <laughs> um, you could, in theory, it could be things like a fistula, but that area is not going to contribute to their subsequent risk of pneumonitis, uh, et cetera, or lung tolerance. Um, this becomes increasingly riskier as the patients develop lesions which are closer into the central structures and the ultracentral structures. I think that's something that is very different than re-irradiating a peripheral lesion that's failed. When you start to get in next to the pulmonary artery and the esophagus and the trachea, um, that's definitely a scarier territory that I think is um, the, the risk-reward ratio is less clear. Um, this was a specific paper that looked at re-irradiation and SBRT, um, and they converted everything into an EQT2 gray per fraction. Um, and at least in their study, they had no uh, high-grade events, you know, grade three to five events. Uh, there was some dyspnea and rib fracture. But you can see that the, the kind of median late, so this is a gray, this is a BD3 corrected. Um, but there, you know, there, there's some plans where we're getting into some pretty significant doses here. Uh, and I think that speaks to just the, the lack of understanding that we have in terms of, um, you know, uh, total cumulative dose constraints that these can handle. Um, but at least in a very select group of patients, uh, the organs that received more than 70 gray, there was no significant late adverse events. Of course, late may be relative, right? So depending on the median follow-up, if we follow these patients longer, they may develop adverse events um, if they manage to beat the cancer. Um, uh, and then this was recapitulated in, the, in their own analysis, the MD Anderson analysis, which again showed that repeat SABR as an option uh, provided high rates of local control, um, at least in the 15 patients that they treated. Surgery, again, I want to bring back onto the table. So uh, a lot of patients that I'll see, you know, will have, there, there's people who come in who are clearly, clearly inoperable. Um, they, you know, it's like the ones that come in in the wheelchair with their oxygen tank. That person is never going to have a surgery. But increasingly, with, with patients' awareness of SBRT as an option, we're getting a lot more people who are making a choice. They're told that they're possibly high risk. They, they maybe are a candidate for a wedge or a segmentectomy, but not a lobe. Um, and they choose SBRT. But that doesn't mean that surgery is completely off the table. So in fact, actually, I think that just changes the scales. When you have a, a minimally invasive or non-invasive therapy that has a low risk of side effects and then it doesn't work, but now you suddenly have this, this, this fact that there is now uh, a recurrence, surgery now, I think, can play a role. And so there is data that's been published on this. Um, and uh, in select patients who have local, local recurrence after SBRT, uh, surgery um, has been done in multiple papers. Um, the first question I always got from my surgeons before they started offering this was, well, what about all the scarring you're going to create? What about all the adhesions that are going to happen? Very focused. This is very focal. And they're going to be removing that part of the lung anyway. So actually, uh, the post-op complications have been relatively modest. So uh, in uh, MD Anderson's experience, they had high rates of vocal control. Um, most of the toxicity they saw were things that you would typically see just because of surgery in general. So AFib is an extremely common post-surgical complication and ileus, et cetera. Um, this is a specific paper by Mara Antonoff um, that looked at their experience at post-SBRT failure surgery. Um, and, you know, interestingly, really the, uh, the pulmonary function tests of the patients who got surgery versus the ones who got SBRT, there was really no difference. So they were able to get these patients who were high risk um, back through uh, a surgery. So I think that is a very reasonable option, um, particularly if the surgeons are willing to consider it. Another alternative would be thermal ablation. So in a patient who has local failure, uh, isolated local failure, percutaneous radiofrequency ablation is certainly an option. 
at our institution, uh, we had a, it, it really seems to be dependent on the enthusiasm and experience of the people who come in. So we had a group that enjoyed doing it and they did it a lot and then they got hired off somewhere else and then we went for like two years where we had nobody um, and not even anybody regionally that I could refer to. Uh, and now suddenly we have a group coming in who's gung-ho again. Um, patients have to be able to tolerate a pneumothorax. You're, you're nearly, unless it's a very peripheral lesion that's adherent to the chest wall, there's a very high likelihood of a patient getting a pneumothorax with a procedure <coughs> like this because it's not just a percutaneous biopsy where there's a high rate on its own. They're in there putting in the probes and then heating and, and so you almost need to just have your chest tube there while you're doing the procedure. It's likely they'll get a pneumo. Um, and just like uh, as is true for radiofrequency ablation in the liver, uh, it's, it's true in the lung. There's a kind of an upper limit at which these procedures are particularly helpful and when the tumors get to be more than three centimeters, it's very difficult to get the coagulative necrosis and, um, and kill with radiofrequency. But again, you know, uh, uh, in a specific select series, when you have a, um, a few patients here in the MD Anderson series, they were able to get thermal ablation and have good uh, primary tumor control. Again, uh, like I said, in our experience, um, maybe not quite so high, uh, but uh, a very reasonable option if you can't re-irradiate and if it's not going to be um, something that can be taken out surgically. I think the least desirable option would be systemic therapy alone. If you have isolated local failure, I, I, you really should be trying to exhaust all your local therapy options before you resort to systemic therapy because systemic therapy will never rid the patient of the tumor. Um, and you're committing them to a, a considerable undisclosed amount of time. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's cytotoxic or immunotherapy. Um, I, I really think that, uh, you know, there's really no data to suggest that you'll get good primary tumor control and they're gonna come back to you anyway. <laughs> you know, they're gonna put them on systemic therapy and that patient eventually is gonna get kicked back to you when the, when the med onc says, okay, well, I've exhausted therapy. Now will you treat? And now the tumor is gonna be three times as big and it's a lot harder to treat. So I would, I would consider doing it earlier. One might ask a question, what the least desirable option for local control would be? And I think chemotherapy is that answer. What about regional failure? So um, something that uh, I'm increasingly seeing uh, is patients who have good primary tumor control. So you've dealt with the primary lesion, but you know, even though the PET was negative at initial diagnosis, um, maybe they had a cult nodal disease and then it declares itself three, six, nine, 12 months later, and you have isolated regional failure. And I think again, this is not a systemic failure. So if the patient seems like they're a candidate, um, medically, you should really be considering treating those patients as if they have stage three disease. That's a person who has, uh, at that point, a TX, N2, or N1 um, disease. Uh, and actually, if anything, it makes it a little bit easier because you're just treating the adenopathy and not having to treat a big bulky tumor in the lung. It's something to be cautious about, but I, I still think that we should consider those patients for definitive salvage uh, therapy with RT plus or minus chemo. Um, as if they're stage three. And we'll talk, I have a slide later on where we'll talk a little bit about composite dose constraints. Um, but again, in the MD Anderson ex experience here uh, with isolated regional nodal failure, good primary tumor control and regional control, um, although with the expected high rates of toxicity you expect when you start to give chemotherapy. You could just give radiation alone um, and, uh, and that is also uh, reasonable. Um, at least at our institution, if a patient's not a candidate for chemotherapy, then what I'll often do is hypofractionate, um, just because I, you know, we, we know that hypofractionation improves local control, um, and you can do it. There's many papers now that show you can give 60 and 15 to 20 fractions safely without chemotherapy, um, and that can be particularly appealing for patients that came to you because they wanted to get a short course of therapy and, and you want to continue to provide that. Um, but we'll talk about again in a minute about how you handle some of those overlaps. So uh, let's talk about those overlaps. Um, composite dose constraints. I could give a whole lecture just about this and about how little we really know. <laughs> um, uh, we spend so much time, at least at our institution, bringing in the old plan and co-registering it and summing the dose uh, and really, there's no 
uniformly agreed upon way to really actually evaluate those dose constraints. Particularly when you have one of them, where it was say a medial tumor here, which was five fractions, and then now you have nodal disease where you're gonna give 30 fractions. Um, and so I think a lot of it just has to do with looking at where the hotspots lie, trying to avoid putting those hotspots in organs that you know are likely to suffer a catastrophic toxicity like a pulmonary artery or a, a, a bronchus or even esophagus, the luminal structures. Um, so, uh, but you know, my kind of words to live by, my, my wisdom as it were, uh, the first thing is that you cannot derive meaningful DVH info by a raw summation of dose by different dose and fractionation regimens. So let me give you an example, because I get this one all the time with my residents. They'll say, look, the composite dose to the cord from the two plans was less than 50 gray. I'm safe. <laughs> but what if you gave 25 to 30 of that gray the first time around with SBRT? That is not biologically equivalent to two gray per fraction. So if you do some quick math, with, our, with these fancy apps now that you can download, which is pretty, I like that. I used to have a spreadsheet, now I can just do an EQD app. And even though it is an imperfect science, I can tell you right away that I would not be comfortable having a two gray per fraction to the cord of almost 60 gray. So you do need to think about the, the different doses um, in fractionation. Um, and I think conservative, be being conservative is always gonna be reasonable. When you, if you are gonna add those doses though, um, there's a highly conservative way to do it, which is to take away the three-dimensional information, ignore that, and then just literally look at the global max doses. So you could say, well, what was the maximum dose to the spinal cord the first time and the max dose the second time? Um, they could be in completely different parts of the body. The max dose could be 10 centimeters away from each other, but you know you can't overdo it that way. That's a very conservative way to look at it. If you, if you actually do add the plans and look at them three-dimensionally and look at the dose distribution, that is gonna be more accurate, but only in as much as you can trust it, right? So patients change, they get thinner, they get bigger, they're in different positions, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what amazing deformable image registration package you have, that's an imperfect science. So um, that is gonna be theoretically the most accurate, so you can say that you're dose to the cord, uh, you know, was geometrically in the right area, but you do need to be thoughtful about the fact that there are some errors in the registration of those two plans. So, um, again, if I was thinking, uh, the reasonable question would be, if you add two different plans together, um, that adding them in the treatment planning system will be the most accurate, but only as much as you can trust it. The better thing to do, of course, would be to prevent this from happening altogether. So we can try and salvage local failure, regional failure, or distant failure, but what if instead we could do something to just reduce that risk altogether? So going back to the NCCM guidelines, um, they essentially say that, uh, with really no evidence at all, um, that if you consider a high-risk stage one patient, and high-risk being larger tumors, perineal invasion, lymphovascular space invasion, they essentially stealing all the stuff from the post-surgical literature and they just kind of flopped it onto the SBRT arm here that you could consider adjuvant cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, I've never given adjuvant cytotoxic chemotherapy SBR after SBRT. Um, just, I'm kind of curious, this isn't an official SAMS question. Show of hands, is anybody, is, are any of the medical oncologists in your groups offering uh, adjuvant chemotherapy after SBRT? Good, <laughs> I, I, I agree with that statement. So by the way, no hands rose uh, there. And I think there's a, there's a number of reasons why you might not wanna do that. First off, again, it's auto-selection. It's the same patient population that couldn't get surgery or wasn't a great candidate for surgery. They're not gonna be a great candidate for high-dose platinum chemotherapy as an adjuvant, which even in the post-surgical trials only has a modest 5% improvement in survival. So I think it's not particularly effective. It's also very challenging in this population. So uh, I can't give a talk without using the word immunotherapy. So here it is. Immunotherapy may be the answer here. Um, uh, we already know, as I've talked about before, we've talked about the survival and PFS improvements from Pacific, but the tolerability is equally important. This was a heavily pretreated population of patients who got definitive high-dose radiation and chemotherapy that were very likely 
sick as all get go at the end of the, their treatment, and then they really tolerated immunotherapy quite well up to, most people got, I think, 80% you know, of the intended cycles of, of immunotherapy afterwards. Um, and particularly, as I mentioned before, the risk of pulmonary adverse events was quite low. And that's for, uh, in this case, Dervalumab, which is anti pd one uh, but certainly we would expect that to be true of the other PD-1 and pd one agents as well. There's also a, a unique opportunity to maybe take advantage of some of the synergy that could happen with SBRT. So as we've talked about before, there's preclinical models um, that uh, radiation, particularly at those higher doses per fraction, may lead to a more immunogenic cell death, more antigen release and uptake, increased T cell infiltration. A lot of this is, people get very dogmatic about this as if like we understand this for real. We don't really. This is a lot of theoretical stuff. Um, there's some nice preclinical data, but but as yet, not really super well described in people yet. Um, I did describe this PEMBRO-RT trial, uh, I think yesterday. Um, this was, a, again, patients who had advanced non-small cell lung cancer, so metastatic disease, where they got pembrolizumab with or without radiation. Uh, in this case, the PFS is not really all that important, but again, the safety is important. Um, so they just kind of documented generically that there was more pneumonia in the SBRT arm that, and they, they broadly classified that as anybody having a pulmonary issue. And, I, and I'd argue those rates are at least in the ballpark of what we often see anyway, depending on the, the, grade, the grade that you would uh, use as your threshold. So if there's evolving data suggesting that it's relatively safe to give SBRT and immunotherapy together, or at least uh, in, in concert with each other, uh, is there potentially a role to give it um, as an adjuvant? Um, and even though the data is relatively modest and evolving, and there really isn't a lot of phase one, two uh, data yet, there's already now three large-scale randomized trials testing this. So pharma is embracing this wholeheartedly, um, which you know could be very good or very bad in the long run, we'll see. So one of them is a intergroup trial. It's a SWOG NRG trial, which is yet to open, but should be soon. Um, and this is, uh, um, looking at atezolizumab, so that's a competing agent to dervalumab. Um, this is being given in an interesting way. They're giving some priming uh, uh, doses of atezo followed by SBRT with a dose of atezo and then additional consolidation of atezo as well. So I think this trial, unlike the other ones I'll talk about in a minute, will can actually answer some of those questions about you know the timing of immunotherapy. Is there is there more toxicity? Is there uh, uh, is there more of a synergy to integrating it? Um, but again, 480 patient randomized trial for early stage lung cancer. That will, these trials will be the largest trials of data we will ever have or have ever had um, prospectively for uh, SBRT for lung cancer. Uh, so it's a little bit ironic that it, you know, it, it took a, you know, pharmaceutical trials to get us our largest SBRT trials. So this one should be opening soon. Megan Daly and Chuck Simone are the co-PIs. Um, another trial uh, is the Merck Keynote 867 trial. Um, as I was looking here at the numbering scheme, I really hope that is not like, because 001 was their first trial. So <laughs> if there's 866 trials preceding this, then we're in trouble. Um, but this is again a randomized trial, early stage non-small cell lung cancer. Um, uh, and they get uh, pembrolizumab, which is their drug. It's the first generation PD anti-PD-1 agent. They get that concurrently with SBRT and consolidation versus SBRT alone. The last one, and I am heavily biased um, since this is my trial, uh, is the uh, Pacific 4 RTOG Foundation trial. This is an AstraZeneca-sponsored trial being run through the RTOG Foundation for Quality Control. Um, again, early stage non-small cell lung cancer, trying to really actually focus more on the higher risk patients. So even though smaller tumors, up to 100 smaller tumors are allowed, most of the patients are supposed to have T1C or greater disease. Um, patients get SBRT standard of care and then are randomized uh, to Derva, which is the drug given in Pacific, or placebo. In this case, the, the drug is being given every four weeks instead of every two weeks as it was uh, because there's now data that suggests you can give that. It's just as efficacious. Uh, it's certainly more convenient to give it once a month than every two weeks. Um, and this is open and enrolling, and we've got about 50-some-odd patients that have been randomized at this point. Um, now, having said that, while I'm really excited about the idea that immunotherapy may 
play a role in the future for these patients, I, I will be less excited if that future means that everybody gets it and it's in the water. Um, uh, patient selection is critical. Uh, and I think one of the most promising selectors of therapy would be something like circulating tumor DNA. So this is really interesting data that comes out of the Stanford group. Uh, we've since hired away Adel Shadori from that group and is working at WashU now. And this is looking at pre versus post treatment circulating tumor DNA levels as a predictor of failure. Um, and at least in this, this early study with their high sensitivity CAPSEQ CTDNA assay, what they were able to show is that um, uh, post-treatment ctDNA, so in the black line, meaning they couldn't detect any, versus the red line, they were able to detect post-treatment ctDNA. It was a powerful predictor of subsequent failure, and in fact, predated what the CT was able to pick up, the CT scans were able to pick up by weeks to months. Um, and, you know, one could question what you can do with this information today, but I think it certainly if you're thinking about whether or not a patient may benefit from an adjuvant therapy, if you already have complete plateau and no circulating tumor DNA and that it was a reasonable surrogate for systemic disease control, then possibly that patient may not benefit from uh, additional adjuvant therapy or vice versa um, if they have high levels post-treatment. So in conclusion, uh, follow-up CT scans recommended every three to six months, depending on your guidelines. SBRT failures remain primarily regional and distant. Tumor size is the strongest predictor. Squamous cell carcinoma, however, is emerging as a powerful predictor of local failure. Um, I think in carefully selected patients, we should not be nihilistic and we should offer additional local therapy uh, to these patients when appropriate. Um, and of course, uh, immunotherapy is here to stay. And that's all I have, thank you. Questions? While I'm walking up there, we did find uh, Valerie has some people left their evaluation sheet yesterday. If you're missing your evaluation sheet and a SAM sheet, I think. So if you're missing that, please see Valerie. On that data on salvage, what was the follow up on those MD Anderson trials? Yeah, sure. So it, it, it was pretty variable, uh, it was a median of a little over a year. So, yes, uh, I. Cert certainly, I would like to see longer term data for us to say that safe. Having said that, um, you know, the paradox there is that if you're alive to get the toxicity, then you, you know, the, the disease ar arguably would have taken your life earlier than that. So it's, it's a double edged sword. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I find this comes up a lot now. And so, you know, obviously, we're, we're still dealing with some of them have gotten those PET scans that have been kind of off their SUVs, three and a half, five and a half, and you're kind of like, yeah, what to do? If we do decide and say, hey, yeah, this really is, it, do I, did I understand you correctly that the dosing that you're using is still the same, the same BED you want greater than 100 and? Yeah, for, certainly for peripheral lesions. For peripheral? We, we have been. For, for central lesions, I've been doing it as a, uh, uh, I'll tend to more hypofractionate those patients. So um, I think, you know, 12, 15 fractions, um, taking a little bit more of a European style approach to that, that's so-called risk adapted. Because uh, if you have a central lesion, which is right up against the bronchus or near the esophagus, where you are already struggling to meet dose constraints the first time, you're definitely not meeting it the second time, which means you may be compromising 30 to 40 percent of your PTV coverage to meet those dose constraints. I think that's where some fractionation can help you out a little bit. Um, having said that, you know, Cleveland Clinic published something not too long ago where they treated central lesions, uh, re re repeat SBRT. They did have some bronchopleural fistulas and pulmonary artery fistulas. Some patients died. Um, uh, so it is scary, but, you know, uh, more patients had control than, than didn't. And, and if you are going to do that, has there been any preference as far as the timing? daily, every two days, every three days, once a week? Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a reasonable question. Um, no, I haven't been doing that. Uh, we just published uh, uh, an experience suggesting that um, for five fractions at least, there, there's no benefit to the every other day. It doesn't reduce toxicity and the control rates are the same between QD and QOD. Um, but maybe in the re-radiation setting, a little bit of time would help. I don't know. Great talk. Um, Two questions. One is in terms of any radio protectors, you know, we, we talked about amifostine and yeah. in the GI, we're looking at some. Do you have any in the lung space? And then the other thing is some of the kind of pre 
thought provo thought provoking idea of in the retreatment setting, we always are trying to cover the whole GTV. You know, is there any data in the yeah. lung? I'm, I was like looking across disease sites to see if we could figure out what to do in like GI, but yeah. you know, where you treat 30% of that re sure. of that area to a really high dose and just know you're not going to cover the rest with the hope that it could, you know, somehow do some magic. I, yeah, I, I, no, no, uh, those are both really good questions. Uh, from a radio protection standpoint, um, mm -hmm. there's certainly nothing that is like overwhelmingly exciting right now in the in the lung space. Uh, I mean, there's people who have been working in this area for a long time, uh, and then we haven't really had anything come out. Um, uh, more recently, even with like ACE inhibitors, that was popular for uh, a while. Um, but absolutely, to your point, um, even if I'm not necessarily trying to create that magic, that, that this kind of lattice or grid-like magic where you're treating really high doses to small parts, uh, and full disclosure, we have a trial doing that, so I'm not trying to be too cheeky. <laughs> um, but I actually think there is value of, of being a very OAR-centric and putting a limit on it and doing the best you can to the rest of the tumor and cooking it. Um, and, uh, you know, at least in the spine world, uh, that's been kind of termed a, a, like a radiosurgical decompression, right? So uh, time will tell whether that's a good idea or not, but I think getting in what you can to the tumor and then respecting the OAR is always reasonable. I wouldn't dose reduce my entire plan just to meet the OAR dose, which is where I see people do that sometimes. All right, should just we get to the just SAMs? One, one quick oh. comment for yeah. you. A couple of times they've asked about every day versus every other day treatment. The reality to that is it's voodoo. Yeah. It came out of the, our early studies back in Indiana University. We met with Jack Fowler, and Jack Fowler said, you'll have reoxygenation within 24 hours, treat every other day. So beyond that, it was basically voodoo. Well, I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate the historical perspective, and we've been working for a while to try and go back on that voodoo. Um, uh, uh, and it's funny, I mean, even, even at WashU, we'll still treat our three fractions every other day. There's this, per, there's this just ingrained way of doing it, but, but, but five fractions uh, for many years now we've been doing QD. Okay. No? Okay. So sad, it's my last five questions, this is it. All right, so question number one. No, that's, no I'm good. Current follow-up guidelines recommend which of the following in the first year after SBRT for early stage lung cancer? Should you, number one, get CT DNA every three months? Should you get a PET every three months? Should you get a CT chest every three to six months? Or should you get a brain MRI every three to six months? All right, outstanding, okay. Um, next question, which of the following is a predictor of local failure after SBRT for early stage lung cancer? Is it squamous cell histology? Do smaller tumors do worse? Or age or race? Which of these is a predictor of local failure after SBRT? You can clearly tell I wrote this talk last and I kept this simpler. <laughs> Okay. Oh, and I apologize if I wrote that a little bit funny. Okay, but anyway, 97% is good. All right, question three. Which of the following is the least desirable local control option following failure of SBRT? Least desirable. Repeat SBRT, chemoradiation, surgery, ablation, or a systemic only agent such as chemotherapy as a way to means of controlling disease locally? Which of these is the least desirable local control option. <coughs> Outstanding again, all right. Okay, couple more, question four. Which of the following is true, evaluating composite doses for re-irradiation? We should, number one, 
Keep the composite core dose less than 50 gray, independent of dose per fraction of each plan. That adding global point max doses, the global doses between the plans, is the most accurate way to represent composite dose? Or is it that adding some co-registered plans may be more accurate, but you have to be careful about uncertainty and co-registration? Or is it that there's really no benefit to composite dose? And I, okay. Don't answer number four. I may have gotten so cheeky in my last comments that I may have seen that there's no value. So we'll eliminate number four as an option. So one, two, or three. <coughs> okay. Outstanding, and last question. Which of the following is true of adjuvant therapy after SBRT for early lung cancer? Does the NCCN recommend adjuvant chemo for all early stage lung cancer? Is combined SBRT and immunotherapy result in very high rates of serious adverse events over SBRT? Is Pacific 4 testing the use of adjuvant DERVA after SBRT? Or is persistent ctDNA after SBRT already an FDA-approved marker <coughs> for selection of adjuvant immunotherapy after SBRT? So which of these is true? Heavily biased question. Advertisement <coughs> for a trial I would love for you guys to enroll on. Outstanding. Okay, that's all I got. Thanks so much. All Appreciate right. it. And go out and have a happy birthday today. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I forgot to answer the questions again. While she's getting ready, we're going to take a little survey tomorrow. Um, but if people leave before kind of the end of the day tomorrow, will you kind of let us know? Because we were on Oahu once before, and uh, we got feedback that people didn't really like it. So it's, this is why it's only been the second time. <coughs> let us know what you thought about Oahu. And then also kind of what, I mean, if it, we'll take a poll tomorrow. So you're here, we'll actually take a poll. But about what is the maximum that you would want to spend for a hotel room? Because we're a little bit squeezed. We don't want to all of a sudden have it be $600 a night and people be freaked out. So um, not that we would go right to the maximum immediately, but if people would just kind of let us know kind of what's their ceiling where they'd be like, ah, uh, maybe it's not worth it. It'll help us when we're booking hotels going in the future. Anyway, thanks. Okay, thank you very much for sticking with us, and we're going to hopefully engage your brain and your mind to be making some neuro-oncology diagnoses in this last talk, so it's going to be very visual, and you are going to be making most of the diagnoses. I did embed this because it is a very visual talk. I embedded some of the SAM questions within the talk itself, so you might want to take a few notes about what your first impression is about these diagnoses, and in putting this together, 
I did so because I recognized the brain is a different organ than the rest of the organs that you're used to dealing with. Of course, as radiation oncologists, you're extremely good at interpreting visual data much better than most uh, of our colleagues. But I think the brain does have some particular um, concerns, particularly, of course, because of the bony skull and the blood-brain barrier and the fact that you need access to a neurosurgeon who is willing to actually give you a biopsy. So I was hoping to show some tumors and some tumor mimics because I think the last thing anybody wants us to do is treat somebody as if they have a brain tumor when, in fact, they have something else going on. Um, this W here is to remind me to tell you that I'm currently at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, my introduction suggested that I came from Hopkins, and there is a Dr. Lynn Taylor at Hopkins, but I didn't want to misrepresent myself. I have never been at Hopkins. I actually trained at the other Washington, Wash U in St. Louis, and then I did neurology at University of Pennsylvania and my neuro-oncology fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. So the neuroimaging questions that we're going to be dealing with are really the big four. Where is it located in the brain? Is it a tumor? How bad is it? And after you treat, is it getting better or is it getting worse? As far as where it's located, of course, in the brain, this location-based differential diagnosis is really very important because you have pituitary tumors, you have pineal region tumors, and obviously if the mass is not in either one of those areas, you can't imagine that that is really the diagnosis. We're going to talk about intra versus extra axial tumors. So those that are exterior to the brain and those that are interior to the brain, and that actually is much more of a challenge than you might think uh, many times. I can remember just this past year uh, seeing a man who presented with a seizure, was seen in the emergency room, had a contrast-enhancing small high vertex lesion that everybody thought was a meningioma. He was reassured it's a tiny little meningioma, it's just a simple focal seizure, we'll treat you with anticonvulsants, you'll be just fine. And then, of course, six months later, it became clear that this was not an extra-axial tiny meningioma, but in fact an intra-axial rapidly progressive glioblastoma, which is not a situation any of us want our patients and families to find themselves in. Uh, the second question, is it a tumor? I would say the two big um, concerning areas that you have to focus on there is ring-enhancing uh, masses that may or may not be tumors, and then this special category of low bar hemorrhage that can be a real uh, problematic area if you don't pay attention um, to the pearls and pitfalls. So I'm going to give you pearls and pitfalls in each one of these categories. The third, how bad is it? Of course, we're going to talk a little bit about how to use neuroimaging for tumor grading. And we'll talk very briefly about the emerging field of radiogenomics, where we're using radiographic criteria to help tell us something about the genetic makeup of the tumor. And I've got two examples of that, one for an IDH mutated glioma and the other for a 1P19Q co-deleted oligodendroglioma. And then the last category, is it better or worse? Of course, the thing that you've talked about many times throughout this week, post-treatment uh, related changes, post-operative changes, and then a little bit of problem solving of how we go about it in neuro-oncology to decide whether something is a treatment-related change. So part one, where is it, inside or outside of the brain? So this is the first one to jot down your answer. This is a tumor, and the question is, is it outside of the brain without brain invasion? Is it outside of the brain with brain invasion? Is it inside of the brain with no exophytic component? Or is it inside the brain with exophytic extension? And I will tell you <laughs> that I don't think this is an easy question. <laughs> this is hard. So just look at it for a minute and just make your own assessment. Hopefully by the end, it'll be an easier question to answer. 
And obviously by showing you a non-contrastive scan, I've, I'm making you work a little harder. Okay, so hopefully you've chosen one of those four. And I would say this issue of whether something is outside or inside the brain is easier to assess when the tumor is small. And I think if you look at these images, it's pretty obvious, particularly the image at the top of the screen, that you've got the natural contrast of the inner table of the skull, you have the darker markings of the sulci, and you've got the gyri to help you see where the tumor is and to say that uh, I think this is probably an extra axial tumor because it appears to be arising from the inner table of the skull and you can kind of see the sulci moving around the mass. So this is easier when the tumor is small. Uh, you can see the sulci and gyri very clearly, they're not ironed out, but it becomes much more challenging when the tumor is larger. And now I think you can see that because you've lost those sulcal margins, the, uh, everything is sort of ironed apart and you can't really tell if this is a mass inside the brain or a mass outside of the brain. Certainly MRI provides important clues. The first would be the CSF cleft sign and this is a small rim of spinal fluid. If you really focus on it, you can see that CSF cleft sign going all the way around the tumor, showing you that this more than likely is exterior to the brain. In addition, there's a cortical buckling sign where you can actually see the cortex is buckled around the brain and is also part of that CSF cleft sign. And of course, the famous dural tail sign that we all know so well, which is this diffuse homogeneous enhancement of the mass the broad base of attachment to the dura, and then these two little dural tails at the end where the mass attaches to the dura. And I think that everyone in this room will recognize this as a classic extra axial mass and would go so far as to be bold enough to say that this is clearly an extra axial meningioma. So when it's easy, it's pretty easy but unfortunately, it's usually much harder than easy, such as in this case, where there is an absence of extra axial signs. So when you have an extra axial mass lesion, you have all the extra axial signs, of course it's simple, and you can get lulled into a sense of being um, too smart for your own good, which unfortunately happens, uh, happens to me more often than I would like to admit. So in this case, there are no extra axial signs, there are no interposed vessels. There is no CSF cleft. So you might say this mass is inside the frontal lobes, clearly, because there are no extra axial signs. However, you can't jump to the conclusion that it implies intraaxial involvement because of the absence of signs. And in this case, I think you can see intracranial extension through the cribriform plate, and this was a case of sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma. Extracranial involvement can be another clue, and in this MRI scan, you see flare signal hyperintensity around um, what looks like an acrotic center. You see enhancement, certainly ring enhancement at the cortical surface. This could be a brain metastasis, certainly. It could be a small glioblastoma, but the other imaging clue, opposed from the fact that there are no interposed vessels and no CSF cleft, which makes you recognize maybe this portion of the mass is inside the brain. There also happens to be enhancement at the inner table of the skull, and there is now extracranial and intracranial involvement, so this is both, and this proved to be Langerhans cell histiocytosis with brain invasion. So back to our first case um, that I made you take notes on. Now you have an enhanced scan as well, and you can see that the enhancement pattern is not particularly homogeneous. 
there is a fairly sharp demarcation between the mass and the brain. I think it's very hard to tell if it's intra or extra axial. And looks like it's dural based, right? There's a dural tail sign, so it should be extra axial. But the pitfall is that the dural tail sign is not specific for meningioma. And so this T2 MRI provides additional clues to the diagnosis. And here are our favorite new signs. The CSF cleft sign, the interposed vessel sign. So that portion is extra axial. There's a cortical buckling sign, but there's no cortical buckling on the other side of the lesion and so this proved to be an intraaxial tumor with exophytic extension outside of the brain. And this was a breast cancer metastasis. So the pearl is that interposed vessels, CSF clefts and cortical buffling, buckling are signs of extraaxial tumors. But the pitfall is that these signs can be seen along exophytic components of intraaxial tumors. All right, so now where is it located? This is location-based differential diagnosis. Obviously, you would all recognize this, I hope, as a very large corpus callosal enhancing mass lesion. And the question is, what is it? And so the next self-assessment question is, is this lesion of the corpus callosum, and there, there are actually very few tumors that grow and extend along the corpus callosum. So the answer is usually one of these four. Is it a glioblastoma, lymphoma, demyelination, or metastasis? So make your own private assessment. This one, as opposed to the first one, I think is much, much more straightforward. So corpus callosal lesions here, of course, is a classic example of a different corpus callosal lesion that is solitary, necrotic, and butterfly in distribution. There are areas of irregular rim enhancement, this non-enhancing core, and then the serpiginous internal vessels. So I think you will all recognize this mass as a very classic corpus callosum glioblastoma. However, there are other rim enhancing pericolosal lesions such as uh, seen in this MRI scan. I don't think you would confuse this for either metastatic disease or for brain tumor. I think this should be fairly clearly, uh, though pericolosal, not in the neoplastic category because the masses are oriented along Dawson's fingers, which is a classic location for demyelination. And this also classic incomplete ring enhancement or a C ring enhancement that you see with demyelinating disease. And I know this looks very straightforward here because there are so many lesions, but it's not really that uncommon that we see somebody with a big ring enhancing mass that we think is neoplastic and fail to consider that there's that open part or the C open ring of enhancement. And yes, this is demyelination. Well, here's another lesion close to the corpus callosum. This is a cingulate mass lesion, a sharply demarcated uh, homogeneous enhancing mass that is obviously putting downward mass effect on this right lateral ventricle compared to the left. It shows that it has intrinsic T1 hyperintensity and there's a tiny second lesion, which gives you a hint to the diagnosis. And this is metastatic disease from melanoma. This, of course, was lymphoma. And the reason it's lymphoma, of course, is homogeneous enhancement. <coughs> These areas of subependymal extension, and this is actually the 
left and the right lateral ventricle here that you see as little slits. And this uh, lymphoma is basically growing around into the subependymal area. And the secondary area of basal ganglia involvement that is so characteristic of primary central nervous system lymphoma. So the pearl is that hypercellular masses that are also usually hyperattenuated on CT, which is to say closer to bone density on a brain CT, and those that diffusion restrict on MRI scan are more often lymphoma. But the pitfall is that in immunocompromised patients, uh, these can often have more of a heterogeneous appearance without this classic lymphoma appearance of homogeneous enhancement, but more rim enhancement. And then a companion case is this central nervous system lymphoma. Probably not. It is hyperdense on CT scan, as you can see, as we said, lymphoma is. It does diffusion restrict, as you can see, on the opposite uh, area, which again is uh, seen in lymphoma, but uh, this hyperdensity and diffusion restriction implies tightly packed cells. It does not necessarily imply that it has to be a lymphoma, as we said here in the pitfall. And back to our MRI, which always helps. Again, the CSF cleft sign, suggesting this is actually an extra axial mass, not inside the brain. The cortical buckling sign, the interposed vessel sign, and so this is an extra axial mass because all those extra axial signs were present. And this is a meningioma. So next, is it tumor dealing with ring enhancing masses? This is a 41 year old woman who presented with difficulty speaking and difficulty walking. And obviously she has these areas of clear vasogenic edema. I would say this pattern of vasogenic edema is very obviously cellular water that is tracking within the brain. To me, this is classic vasogenic edema, whereas this pattern uh, is seen much more commonly with solid tumors and doesn't have that same uh, fingers of water tracking along the gyri and sulci appearance that you get with more classic vasogenic edema. There appears to be a mass hidden within the vasogenic edema. And so, of course, I think this is a pretty easy pearl for all of us to agree to, that vasogenic edema on an unenhanced CT scan definitely should prompt an MRI with contrast. And you can see the mass there and there. You can also see the posterior limb of the internal capsule just showing that brain water as it tracks around normal brain structures. And you can see there's another tumor, solid tumor mass hidden in the vasogenic edema there next to the motor strip. And with enhancement, you can see these multiple ring enhancing lesions there, which gets us to the magical doctor mnemonic. Now I realized when I reminded myself that I had put this slide in this talk, that you're going to think I put cartoon characters and um, other sort of uh, people in every talk, but I promise you I don't. This is the last superhero hero you will see. This is um, Benedict Cumberbatch in the role of Dr. Strange, and he is there to remind you of the magical Dr. Mnemonic for ring enhancing brain tumors. Metastases, that one's easy, you all know that. Abscess, that can be a real um, confuser, I would say. Glioma and granuloma. Subacute infarcts, and I don't think this is a minor addition to the list. I cannot tell you how many patients I've seen over time who presented with sudden onset of symptoms, seems very stroke-like, has a scan where you see an enhancing mass, and ultimately it proved to be a subacute infarct and not a tumor. It's very, very easy. Enhancing masses in their brain, everyone assumes it's a tumor, but then I get a history that they've fallen, they've had some trauma, and the ultimate diagnosis proves to be contusion. So I would say of the ones on this list that are particularly problematic in practice would be subacute infarcts, contusion, 
abscess. AIDS is in there for toxoplasmosis and immune reconstitution, lymphoma, as we've already discussed, demyelinating disease, and what used to be called radionecrosis, but of course you all know that it's really treatment-related necrosis related just as much to systemic drugs and immunotherapy than to radiation. So here is our magical doctor mnemonic. Here is a case with multiple enhancing masses and make your own private assessment of which one of those this represents. Metastases, abscesses, granulomatous disease, infarcts, contusions, toxolymphoma, demyelinating disease, and radiation necrosis, and we'll come back to that. So here's some more examples of ring-enhancing metastases on MRI scan. This one has T1 hyperintense met hemoglobin. And this, on a T2 star image, has a blooming artifact. And these were hemorrhagic lung cancer metastases. These are some similar hemorrhagic metastases on CT. And I think you can see the fluid blood layering, the individual metastatic lesions, but I'm not sure if all of you have seen the next area of metastasis, so look around to see if you can see the next area in the eye. So multiple hemorrhagic lesions in the absence of trauma, of course, suggest metastatic disease. And then you can use the MRCT mnemonic to try and help with these hemorrhagic lesions because the metastatic lesions most likely to bleed in the central nervous system are said to be Mr. CT, melanoma, renal cell, choriocarcinoma, and thyroid cancer. However, as you all know, because breast and lung cancers are far more common, they can also present with hemorrhage. This is an example of a double ring enhancing abscess that could mimic a brain metastasis. However, you'll see there's enhancement of the ependymal lining of the opposite ventricle, something you don't usually see without leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. And you can also see some layering here of spinal fluid and protein with this protonaceous debris in the lateral ventricle. So in this case, a diffusion-weighted MRI scan is really helpful because you can see really significant diffusion restriction and it's dark on the ADC map. Usually, this is appearance of a pyogenic abscess which shows this restricted central diffusion. So this was pyogenic abscess with pyocephalus. Then is this abscess or tumor? You'll notice you've got a diffusion scan in which there is not restricted diffusion on the right, yet it is a ring enhancing lesion. So is it abscess or is it tumor? And this was neurocystocercosis. So the pitfall here is that not all ring enhancing CNS infections display restricted diffusion. This is obviously a large mass lesion, um, obviously inside the brain. You can see these vessels with the necrotic core, so again, much more characteristic of primary high-grade glial neoplasms that we're used to seeing. And so this is a classic glioblastoma. Obviously, many times we are struggling with masses inside the brain, and particularly if it's in the dominant hemisphere, neurosurgeons who are very uh, unwilling to biopsy something because, of course, they don't want to make somebody worse, particularly if it's anywhere near the language center. So in this mass, in the left frontal lobe, with a large amount of vasogenic edema, which encompasses the language area, we had to use a different way of trying to get at the answer 
and you can see this MR spectroscopy here. Choosing to look at that voxel in which you see depressed normal metabolites of NAA, choline, and creatinine, and a markedly elevated lipid peak. And this was a tuberculoma. Uh, that is not a neoplastic MR spectroscopy. How about this? Is this a tumor? There's our incomplete rim sign. I would say extremely incomplete. Certainly isn't a C. It's just a very incomplete rim of enhancement. And this is an example of tumefactive demyelination. And I would say in the past 15 years, I've had three times where unfortunately I've made a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis based on a brain biopsy, not the recommended way to make that diagnosis. So the pearl is that incomplete rim enhancement strongly favors demyelination. All right, radionecrosis, and as I know this audience appreciates, uh, the first bullet is in order to make a diagnosis of radionecrosis, you actually have to have a history of radiation therapy, and I prefer to call it treatment-related necrosis, which, as you all know, mimics high-grade tumor recurrence. And as you also know, anatomic imaging alone is completely unreliable in distinguishing brain tumor progression from radionecrosis, um, as is true, I think, in many other parts of the body. All right, so now we're moving on to HIV AIDS, toxoplasmosis versus lymphoma. In toxoplasmosis, you usually have multiple lesions that tend to want to hug the basal ganglia, the thalamus, and the hemispheres. Usually with toxoplasmosis, thallium spect and FDG PET are negative. In lymphoma, which likes to be deep and subcortical, hugging the ventricles generally, Thallium spect and FDG PET are usually positive. In addition, you have this target sign, which is usually seen in toxoplasmosis. So a target sign on T1 with gadolinium and or T2 flare MRI is rather specific for toxoplasmosis in this setting and helps differentiate toxoplasmosis from lymphoma. Here you see another example of toxoplasmosis with multiple target signs. And so now we're back to our case. Most ring enhancing, but not all. Is this metastatic disease? Well, it could have been, but you get more history. And this one was a fooler for us, actually. I think we thought it was metastatic disease, and we were trying to decide what to do, because as you can see, the lesions are um, multiple. Uh, certainly this one was in an area that could have been biopsied, but all the others, particularly this one, uh, this is too small, this is too deep. Uh, that could have been biopsied. And so I can't remember now why we equivocated for so long, but somebody went back to the bedside and got more history, which is always a good test to do. She was Ethiopian. She was HIV positive. Actually wasn't known until after the MRI. Uh, then she developed PCP pneumonia while hospitalized after this MRI. CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis were negative for any primary cancer. CSF flow cytometry was negative and her toxoserologies were positive, so this was toxoplasmosis. And I know this audience is much too sophisticated to assume that multiple ring-enhancing lesions are metastatic disease, but it is easy to fall into that trap. So is it a tumor, in this case, of lobar hemorrhage? So this is a 45-year-old woman who presents with sudden aphasia, so she's presenting with a sudden stroke-like history, and she's got on this CT scan a obvious hemorrhagic mass, which you can see here on uh, T1 MRI scan and post-contrast MRI scan. <coughs> so for this lobar hemorrhage, is this a stroke? 
Is it vasculitis, amyloid angiopathy, something which produces multiple brain hemorrhages, usually in elderly patients, though to be truthful, usually small um, petechial hemorrhages rather than a large mass, though large masses of hemorrhage can occur in that condition. Vascular malformation or tumor. So vasculitis or primary angiitis of the central nervous system um, can be seen and can definitely be a tumor mimic. There's also reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome and usually you can make this diagnosis by cerebral angiography and a good history. So I wouldn't say that it's very commonly confused with tumor. Uh, this is a, an angiogram of somebody with central nervous system vasculitis and you can see these multifocal areas of arterial narrowing. And this is a case of amyloid angiopathy, which I described showing these multiple areas of hypo-intense old microbleeds on a T2 star image, and then this mass of contrast enhancement. Now we have a different patient, a 41-year-old with headache and this mass lesion in their brain. You'll notice the popcorn sign. This again is a really common tumor mimic, very, very common. It has very minimal enhancement uh, with gadolinium. There's a hemosiderin rim and there's blooming artifact. And don't forget, it's very easy when I show myself the various images to really get a lot out of the different sequences. But if you're like me, and I'm sure you are, and you're busy in the clinic, it's not uncommon for me to just look at an axial flare an axial post gadolinium. Um, I always show my patients and their families their images, so we look at them together. Very common as well to show a sagittal post gadolinium or a coronal post gadolinium because of that question always is, well, where is it in my brain? And it can help people get an understanding of where it is. But I spend so much time doing that with patients and families, I can't tell you how many times I've failed to look at these very important sequences. So obviously, Partnership with a really good neuroradiologist is important so they can call you up and tell you what you've missed because I do not look at my T2 star sequences and I only usually look at the diffusion weighted images if I'm thinking it might be lymphoma or an abscess. So you do have to be very, very careful. And this turned out to be a cavernous malformation, uh, another common tumor mimic. With this speckled enhancement pattern, and so the, the speckled or popcorn appearance should suggest cavernous malformation to you, particularly in a deep lesion. Um, and I've seen these in people with obviously um, uh, localized lung cancer diagnosis who for some reason gets a scan of the brain and then all of a sudden everybody wants you to do stereotactic radiotherapy of this obvious brain metastasis and I think it's, it can be quite a pitfall if you don't know to look out for this. So CAVMALs can be easily mistaken for acute blood on CT scan. So now we've got a 71-year-old woman, sudden onset of left-sided weakness. Um, tumor looks relatively benign on this post-contrast scan, high up at the vertex. You can see it uh, on the MRI scan adjacent. But on closer inspection on the flare sequences, there were areas of gyral thickening, which you can see here, the fat thickened gyrus on this side compared to the normal gyri on this side. So this is the pitfall of satisfaction of search. Make sure you don't fall in love with whatever mass you look at first and you search around very carefully for clues that that might have been the tip of the iceberg connected to <coughs> perhaps a primary tumor elsewhere. Because one month later, the mass is bigger and you can see on this side of the brain, a lot of that sulcal enlargement and on the other side of the brain, normal sulcal anatomy. So I thought it was very interesting in the last talk that one of the things you look for with lung cancer is this bowing out or rounding or mass effect. And that's, of course, exactly what we're pointing out here uh, 
in the brain. So one month later, this hemosiderin rim, this methemoglobin. So is this a cavernous malformation? Uh, but no, and this is the other caveat. A lot of times, particularly Harborview is our big uh, referral center for stroke and trauma. And every year, 150 patients come to the University of Washington through the Harborview system. And because Harborview is our stroke center, and when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, everybody at Harborview gets stroke sequences, and they come to us with all these stroke sequences, and it can be a real problem because, of course, most of those patients that we see end up having highly malignant brain tumors that have bled as their stroke and only are found to have tumors later. So this pearl is please be aware that most stroke MRI scans are non-contrast. And if you see a patient with a low bar intracranial hemorrhage, um, you'd better uh, work it up with a scan that gives you contrast. Because three months later, this is now a disorganized, unresolving mass with a necrotic rim and the same gyral thickening I referred to before. And of course, this was a hemorrhagic glioblastoma that presented as if it was a stroke. And there's the enhancing tissue. So the pearl there is an acute hemorrhagic infarct should not enhance, so peripheral nodular enhancement should suggest neoplasm. So part three, how about tumor grading? So which of these questions is false? Non-enhancing tumors are often low grade. Enhancing tumors are nearly always high grade. High choline and low NAA on spectroscopy correlates with higher glioma grade. And high cerebral blood volume is a poor prognostic sign regardless of whether you have a low grade or high grade glioma. So I'm gonna answer that question in the next few slides. Um, Non-enhancing tumors are often low grade is true. This lack of enhancement signifies an intact blood-brain barrier. Um, so I think that statement is true. This is a case of gliomatosis, non-enhancing. And as you all know, in the WHO 2016 classification, which I'll talk about more tomorrow, this concept of gliomatosis no longer exists as a pathologic <coughs> category in the 2016 update, but it's still a clinical and radiographic diagnosis. So this patient had gliomatosis cerebri. So up to one third of high grade gliomas uh, do not enhance. So not all unenhanced masses are low grade. And this is an example of a non-enhancing high grade glioma seen on spectroscopy. Take that voxel there and show elevation of choline, but there's a lactate doublet and this is an anaplastic astrocytoma, both by MR spectroscopy and eventually proven by biopsy. The second statement was enhancing tumors are nearly always high grade, that is false, because there's an enhancing nodule of tumor. And this of course is a ganglioglioma, which is a WHO grade one tumor. So this is the low-grade signature on spectroscopy. Choosing that voxel. Choline is not elevated above creatinine. NAA is pretty high up or only mildly reduced. And by the way, I meant to mention Hunter's angle on MR spectroscopy. So um, of course, uh, I can't remember his last name, but the neurosurgeon's name was Hunter something. So of course he named it Hunter's Angle because he decided the easiest way to read MR spectroscopies was to take his comb out and take his comb and lay his comb over the NAA, choline, and creatinine. And so a normal Hunter's Angle is when NAA is high, creatinine is intermediate, and choline is low. So that's a real quick visual to know that you don't have a neoplastic signature is when Hunter's Angle is uh, normal, obviously, when choline is elevated twice that of creatinine, that is a neoplastic signature. So this is the MR spectroscopy <coughs> signature of a low-grade astrocytoma. The NAA peak, of course, represents 
neuronal integrity. So when you have something widely infiltrating normal brain, the NAA will go down. And so with a low-grade astrocytoma, because brain is infiltrated but not particularly um, dramatically so, as with a higher-grade tumor, you only get mild reduction in NAA. And this is a similar low-grade signature, but on MR perfusion instead of spectroscopy of this tumor here. The cerebral blood volume ratio is low in this case, whereas a high-grade signature on MR spectroscopy, as I've already alluded to, is this very high choline to creatinine ratio. Generally, the choline has to be greater than two, the creatinine, um, to give a assurance that you're dealing with a high-grade glioma. And then, as we talked about, this very low NAA because of all the destruction of normal neuronal architecture. And then this is a high-grade signature on MR perfusion tumor there, perfusion there. And in this case, the cerebral blood volume ratio is very, very high. So both perfusion and spectroscopy, of course, can be extremely helpful, though um, it has been said that because so many of these MR spectroscopies fall into the intermediate category that it's not obviously as helpful as we would like it to be. So how bad is it, or radiogenomics? This is the WHO uh, classification we'll spend more time on tomorrow, but I just want to focus on these two areas, IDH mutation and 1P19Q status. And this IDH wild type, lower grade tumor, which can be um, acting like a molecular glioblastoma, a concept that we did not really have before 2016. So this idea that imaging can predict molecular status, I think, is really um, important, um, particularly now that we're looking at IDH mutation, 1P19Q co-deletion. Even though grading remains based on light microscopy and immunochemical markers, we're trying to use these uh, radiogenomic markers such as T2 flare mismatch, which I think is a really, really important, um, probably the most important thing to think about. You can actually decide if a tumor has an IDH mutation if your pathologist hasn't been checking for that. Uh, there are some sites that can look at 2HG using proton MR spectroscopy, but it's very, very early in its usage and really outside of clinical trials. Um, it is very difficult and technically challenging for the radiologist as well, but this is an example on the top of an IDH mutated glioma, which was identified by this little 2HG um, peak, which was not present for the tumor type below. So here you have a radiogenomic sign, uh, and you have a classical sign. Uh, the one there is IDH status which, as you know, is very important and leads to longer survival for most of our patients. And this non-enhancing T2 flare mismatch, which I'll explain in the next slide, absolutely predicts IDH mutant tumors. And this sign is so important to me in my practice because I have so many young people who had their lower grade gliomas diagnosed, say, 10 years ago. Um, and it's really expensive to pull the old paraffin archive tissue to check their IDH status, and yet it's so important to them prognostically. The really important thing to know about the T2 flare mismatch sign is it is 100% specific to an IDH mutation. The only problem is um, it's not very, um, it's not very reliable in terms of uh, sensitivity, I would say, or specificity, one of the other. And this classical sign of 1P19Q co-deleted oligodendroglioma, which is this pattern of staghorn calcifications within the tumor and also leads to better response to treatment because this is, of course, your classic oligodendroglioma. So this is the T2 flare mismatch sign. What is required is you cannot look for this on an enhancing tumor, so it has to be a non-enhancing tumor. And you have to look at the T2 first and the T2 signal has to be completely homogeneous, and you'll notice this T2 signal is very homogeneous, whereas on the flare, 
you've got this hypercompacted rim around the entire tumor. This hypercompacted rim of IDH mutated tumors actually makes it easier for the surgeons to remove the tumor. And so one of the reasons we think that patients with IDH mutations do better is they're more often in the frontal lobe, they're easier for the uh, surgeon to take out. But this sign, T2 flare mismatch, as you see here, is 100% specific for IDH mutant non-codeleted tumors. And it's usually seen in the grade two and grade three tumor types. Uh, however, it's not confined to those tumors, and this little tiny abnormality also shows T2 flare mismatch. It's a false positive. That turned out to be a cortical vascular malformation, so that is the pitfall that it can occur in other non-tumor lesions. But when it occurs in the setting of a mass that looks to you like an intraparenchymal low-grade tumor, it is 100% reliable. talked about that. And then this is a woman who presented with seizures and personality change. And her T2 blooming, macroscopic calcifications. And this um, is an oligodendroglioma, which should be C, IDH mutated, 1P19Q co-deleted. And she also had gliomatosis cerebri. So these curvilinear blooming artifacts can also be mistaken for flovoids. And to make sure I get to the same questions and get you out on time, I think I'm going to stop right there. Can we move on to the same questions to make sure we get people out on time? Because I went two minutes over. You ha Lynn, you have time. You're, I do? You're, yes, you sure? You, yes. Okay. It says up here I went on for 48 minutes. It's okay? All right. Thank you. Okay. What about glioblastoma IDH status? Uh, we know in primary glioblastomas, IDH wild type is greater than 90% of the cases. These are our older patients, and they usually have these large contrast-enhancing tumors with central necrosis, which is quite typical. Whereas in our IDH mutated secondary glioblastoma patients, um, even though it's a small portion of the patients, it's an extremely important group, as you know, because they're younger, they have a higher percentage of non-enhancing tumor volume and this frontal lobe association, which I've already told you about. So this is a good example of an IDH wild type on one side versus an IDH mutant tumor on the other side You'll see that that classic vasogenic edema pattern that I told you about before kind of surrounds the IDH wild type tumor, showing it to be a more classic rapidly growing tumor that pushes that vasogenic edema out into the surrounding brain. Whereas in this case, you once again have that um, gyriform enlargement and mass effect that you can see as an area of flare signal hyperintensity, suggesting that this high grade glioma arose from a lower grade glioma, as well as involvement of the corpus callosum. So on the one side, classic appearance of a WHO grade four wild type tumor, and on the other, an IDH mutated tumor. That is actually a venous angioma. Um, we don't really quite understand why, but there is an association of venous angiomas which often seem to grow right through uh, the middle of a tumor, usually diffuse astrocytoma. This was low on ADC map. However, it was very high on perfusion with high blood flow and had a very neoplastic high-grade signature with a high choline and a depressed NAA. So this was Though a grade three astrocytoma, it was IDH wild type, otherwise known as a chemical glioblastoma. And then lastly, is it getting worse post-treatment? Um, you've all seen the RANO criteria for glioma. I really, really, really don't think the RANO criteria is particularly helpful or useful. 
You'll notice here that um, to have complete response, all enhancement has to go away, flare has to be stable or decreased, no new lesions, no corticosteroids, patients have to be better, and you need all of these to have a complete response, which needless to say, never happens with my primary brain tumor patients. Um, to have stable disease, you have to have um, no more than 25% increase or uh, some shrinkage. Everything has to be stable on the flare, no new lesions, clinical status stable. And so it's the only the category of progressive disease uh, which allows any of these to be present. All the other categories require all. And I think it's a very clunky and difficult uh, criteria to follow, the RAINO criteria. So I think I heard somebody talk about how the resist criteria isn't that helpful either. So I think at least thematically between the brain and the body, we can all, we can all agree. So this is a WHO grade three anaplastic astrocytoma patient four weeks post radiation therapy and temozolomide. And I know you're all extremely familiar with this situation where this little um, partly contrast enhancing mass uh, four weeks post radiation therapy and temozolomide looks like this pretreatment and four weeks post. And by RANO criteria, which one would this fit? Complete response, partial response, stable disease, progressive disease, or none of the above. So you can't call it a complete response or a partial response, of course, because there's more enhancement. It's not stable because it's more enhancement. Um, you can't call it progressive because you're within 12 weeks of the end of your radiation therapy and you know you need biopsy evidence in that window uh, to call it progressive disease. So per RANO criteria, um, it's none of the above and you are um, assumed that this is post-treatment related change and you're to continue therapy and observe closely. And this, of course, classic case goes on to completely improve six months later. And then finally, is it getting worse from a post-operative standpoint? This is recurrent non-enhancing tumor before operation, residual tumor post-op. And then you see this on the 12-week post-op baseline scan. And the question is, what is it? Is it residual tumor? Is it an infarct? Is it an expected post-op change? And I would say this comes up a lot too, and this is also very cumbersome and difficult to know whether it's to be included in the tumor volume or not. Uh, this did diffusion restrict with low ADC values and was wedge-shaped, and this was thought to be an acute post-op infarct, not part of the tumor volume. You can see that it had characteristic gyriform enhancement, and this we argue about this with our surgeons all the time, whether this is really a post-operative stroke per se, or is it just this actively devascularized parenchyma that of course any surgeon would get um, with the kind of surgery that they do. But it can be mistaken for enhancing tumor progression, so I would say that is another pitfall. And then in terms of assessing non-enhancing tumor, as well as the fact that it is very slow over time. If you compare this tumor two months prior to current, it looks exactly the same. But if you go back in time four years prior, clearly it is slowly progressing over time. And this, I would say, is another thing that we argue about a lot. I would say it is not, it is not the fact that there is more flare hyperintensity on the current scan. I think more importantly, you can see the lateral ventricle here is not being compressed or distorted. And you can see that the gyral thickness is basically the same on both sides. Whereas here, uh, I think you can see that there's starting to be that, that volume effect again. And so it's this plumping up of the flare signal in our younger patients that is so difficult to see. And you do sometimes need that much time to be aware. And then lastly, is it getting worse? This patient had radiation therapy for a low-grade glioma. And we'll look at FGG PET accuracy. 
of close to 80% in a situation like this. Here's a suspected high-grade glioma showing early pet uptake and delayed washout. You can also use spectroscopy, as we've talked about before, showing this elevated choline to creatinine. You can use perfusion techniques showing high blood volume ratios. And so the answer was the one that is false is that gadolinium-enhanced MRI alone cannot reliably distinguish tumor recurrence from post-radiation treatment effects. And then lastly, last two slides, radionecrosis in a long-term survivor, 2003, a gliosarcoma, and of course, 2010, forgive me, treatment-related necrosis seven years later. Now I'm at the end, and now I will stop and ask for questions. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. I just had a question about um, follow-up post SBRT um, or SRS for uh, brain treatments. Um, do you have uh, any figures or um, can you recommend what type of imaging study we can use to determine between radionecrosis and progression given the, what those for brain metastases or primary? Either. Okay. Um, so welcome to our tumor board every week where we spend at least 50% of the time arguing about this. I have the same problem. So, yeah. So I think nobody has, nobody has good answers. And I would say when we get dogmatic about it and we go into our corners and we insist it's tumor or necrosis, um, and then the patient finally comes to surgery, and this was true even back when I was a fellow, when we were arguing about it at Memorial and took the patients to surgery, I would say it's always both in my experience. It's usually always both things are present at the same time. And of course, what the patient and family want to know is, well, okay, is it 90% tumor and 10% treatment effector the other way around? Um, I don't have any good answers for you. I think for all the reasons that I've shown you, every one of these ways to assess um, is fraught with difficulty. And even when the spectroscopy, the perfusion, uh, time, tincture of time is probably your best test actually, um, and how the patient is clinically. But no, I have these conversations with my patients, my families, and a tumor board every week, and I, I have no good answers for you. I wish I did. Any other questions? And so I guess we'll do the real Sam. Oh no, there's only five. Yeah. 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 He's just reminding me that we only get five Sam questions. So all those embedded in the talk are not necessarily the Sam questions. I just so I, you ended up getting bonus questions, but you're only going to be judged, I suppose, on these. Okay, so question one, hopefully everyone gets this one now because that's how we started out the talk. So this tumor inside the brain with brain invasion, uh, with extra brain invasion or not, or exterior to the brain um, with or without brain invasion. Yeah, which one is it? One, two, three, <coughs> or four? He didn't do it yet. Darn it. Okay, so I think we talked about the various signs um, of <coughs> extraaxial versus intraaxial lesion. But as I said at the beginning, I do actually think that's a really tricky one. The concept of a breast cancer metastasis at the cortical junction with an exophytic component, I, I think that's something you rarely see in practice. And obviously, it was chosen to be particularly difficult uh, in this kind of setting. But I think it's 
It's probably very rare clinically. So I'm not surprised not everyone got that right. This one hopefully is much easier. Is this glioblastoma, lymphoma, and multiple sclerosis or metastasis? And yeah, we talked about that. All right, which statement about tumor grading is false? Non-enhancing tumors are always, are, excuse me, often low grade. Enhancing tumors nearly always high grade. High choline and low NAA correlates with higher glioma grade. And we're looking for false statements here. High blood volume, high cerebral blood volume is a poor prognostic sign for both low-grade and high-grade gliomas. How'd you know? <laughs> yeah, I think if you answered the question maybe uh, it was the false one, not the true one. All right, and this number four, what is the most likely diagnosis? IDH wild type, poor prognosis. IDH mutant with 1P19Q intact. IDH mutant in 1P19Q co-deleted, likely to respond to therapy, or not a brain tumor at all. This is an arteriovenous malformation. I didn't do a very good job on that one, did I? <laughs> so that one, I would say the characteristic staghorn calcifications on CAT scan without contrast are only seen in oligodendroglioma patients. And by definition, oligodendrogliomas by 2016 criteria are now 1P19Q co-deleted and IDH mutated. If you don't have those two molecular mutations, it's not an oligodendroglioma, and only oligodendrogliomas calcify. That's why that was such a characteristic um, 1P19Q co-deleted oligo. And then the last question, which statement is false about progressive glioma versus treatment-related pseudoprogression? Um, gadolinium enhanced MRI can reliably distinguish between the two. PET is more than 75% accurate for distinguishing glioma from radionecrosis. Elevation of the choline-creatinine ratio correlates with tumor recurrence, and elevation of cerebral blood volume correlates with tumor recurrence in this setting, and you're looking for the false statement, not the true statement. Pretty close. Okay, and then one last thing, just to circle back to the question that you asked me, I think uh, the real answer is it's very institution specific. So when I was at Tufts in Boston, the, the answer would have been PET scan. And now the I'm at University of Washington, the answer is MR spectroscopy perfusion. But I think the other real answer is a bunch of your colleagues from radiation oncology, medical oncology, neuro-oncology, and surgery arguing about it together with a neuroradiologist. Um, I think probably all those modalities put together are required, and we're still wrong probably more than a quarter of the time. That's the best answer I have. Thank you. Enjoy Thank that. you.